Virgi tiesiog užmutintas garsas, man atrodo. Užmutintas garsas. O dabar vienas du trys, vienas du trys, ok. Mikrofoną gal arčiau, jeigu galit. Vienas du trys, vienas du, turkui. Vienas, du, vienas, du, ok. Gerai, tai nebejūdinkit. Kaip yra, taip ir jūs buvo. So good morning, everyone. I'm delighted you have joined us today in the conference hall and uh, online. I guess the significant part of the audience will be listening and participating online. And as a coordinator of this event, I am happy to announce uh, the beginning of the 21st International Music Theory Conference, Principles of Music Composing, the Phenomenon of Creativity. While surviving the pandemic last year in a virtual form, this year the conference returns with the experience of the new ideas and takes on a hybrid form. S the presentations this year will be read both live and remotely. And this will allow to, to restore the longing for direct communication of everyone and at the same time open unlimited geographical opportunities to both observe and actively participate in the conference events. The conference focuses on the phenomena of creativity and this topic covers a very wide field of research. So 18 presentations will be made during three days of the conference by the speakers from such countries as Canada, Hong Kong, United Kingdom, Greece, Serbia, Czech Republic, Estonia and Lithuania. Two concerts will also complement the program of the conference. I would like to express many thanks to the organizers and supporters of this event. Conference is organized by Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theatre and Lithuanian Composers Union. It is supported by Lithuanian Council for Culture. I would also like to express many thanks to all the people who contributed to this event and made it possible to happen. Uh, now I would like to invite to tell a few words and to address the audience the Vice Rector of the Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theatre, Ramunia Balevičiūtė. Thank you very much, Marius. So let me welcome you and at this very special event already the 21st conference dedicated to music theory. Me, as a representative of theater field, I must confess that I envy you such an exciting topic because phenomenon of uh, creativity is really at the very core, at the very center of uh, cognitive sciences, um, art research and, and also um, other research. So I wish you very, very inspiring, inspiring discussions and observations, insights, and um, I hope you will have very 
joyful three days of this event. So, good luck. Thank you. I would also like to introduce the head of scientific committee and the founder of the conference, Professor Riemann Tassinelauskas, who also was awarded the Chilonis Prize recently for his research work. A few words. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome dear guests, participants, and all those who participated in the conference. Uh, in the conference dedicated to the ingenious Lithuanian painter and composer, Mikolaos Konstantinos Shilonis. I wish all of you productive and creative work new scientific ideas, a pleasant atmosphere of communication, and all the very best. Good luck. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Due to the hybrid form of the conference, uh, the presentations and discussions will be also available on Zoom platform, and the whole event is broadcasted live via virtual TV channel of Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theatre. Uh, thus, the significant part of the audience will be able to watch the event online. So, I hope we will have a very productive work and, uh, and uh, I invite to exchange your thoughts, ideas and have a good time during three days of the conference, also attend the concerts. And now I would like to give the floor to the moderator of the first session, Ramunas Motekaitis. Welcome. Good morning, dear colleagues. It's a great honor to be the chair of this first session and to discuss these topics of which are important to all of us, composers, musicologists. And I would like to remind that there is approximately 20 minutes for presentation and let's leave five minutes for questions or comments. So please try to fit somehow into this 25 minutes frame. And the first speaker of our morning session is Milos Satkalik, our friend who participated in many conferences and he is also a board, a member of board of this conference. So, and his presentation is called Artistic Creativity between Freud, Deleuze and Thomas Nagel. So please, Milos, and it will be online presentation. Please take a floor. some technical problems but no longer technical problems okay uh, i i had to wait to be unmuted i couldn't unmute myself anyhow hello everyone um, thank you for this introduction uh, i would also like to ask to be able to share the screen uh, i'm sorry milosh can you please wait a minute because we cannot see you there are some technical problems is Just a moment. So, cool. but, do, but you hear me all right. Uh, we can hear you. I can, I can see myself well. and I can see uh, Carosa's hall and I can see uh, other icons, but I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's not so necessary to see. We can start just with sound and then we do. Um, yeah, but could I be allowed to share the screen?
Uh, okay, uh, I can share the screen now. Of, uh, just a moment, please. Okay, now I suppose you can see uh, my title slide, Artistic Creativity between Freud, Deleuze, and Thomas Nagel. Uh, artists employ their sounds or words or lines and colors to create new worlds. There must be moments when the act of creation is accompanied by a feeling of omnipotence or being a demiurge, a god. Few artists are spared a touch of narcissism. Yet it is not uncommon for truly creative individuals to minimize their own role in the creative process and describe it as an externally focused experience. Johannes Brahms talks about a trance-like condition in which the most inspired ideas come, and he attributes them to God. Similar statements were heard from Max Bruch, Puccini, Richard Strauss, and there is, of course, Tartini is there. Admittedly, this sounds quite 19th century. -ish. Imagine Boulez or Milton Babbick pronouncing statements like this. Yet I challenge each of us who have done some composing in our lives to give a precise and exhaustive account of our own composing process. Can we really pinpoint the origin of every idea, provide a compelling reason for every solution, reduce the entire process to a chain of conscious and rationally explicable decisions? And can we honestly claim that the process of creation has never taken us to the realms we have not initially envisaged. It is safe to say that we are not always fully in charge of the process. Over the last a little over a hundred years, we don't hear so much about divine inspiration, but we can hear creators talking about chance. What I have in mind is not aleatorics or improvisation, but something in the nature of the following statement by the Anglo-Irish painter, Francis Bacon. I wanted to make a picture of a bird alighting on a field, but the lines I had drawn somehow took on a kind of independence and suggested something totally different, the man under the umbrella. In a similar vein, the prominent theorist of social systems, Nicholas Luhmann says, most of the time, artists are in no position to provide a satisfactory account of their intentions. The first impulse is never the artist's own invention, but something one attributes to the artist as intention when observing the work. Even the artist can see what he wanted only upon realizing what he has done. He's involved in the creation of the work primarily as observer or physically as a skilled handyman. The work of art speaks back to its author or appears to come from somewhere else, says Simon O'Sullivan. Let us also recall that Roland Barthes proclaimed the death of the author. Generally, the creators are keenly aware of the authorship and the credit they claim for the creation, and at the same time, lacking awareness of the exact source of their ideas. I'm not trying to resolve the paradox. Instead, my present aim is to discuss three of the many possible directions in which we can reflect on it. First, psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis has long since recognized connections between music and the unconscious. The connection has been studied by numerous scholars, myself included, and I will try to be as brief as possible. The role of sound is paramount in infancy, even in the prenatal period. This slide gives a brief overview of the unconscious mind with the emphasis on the role of sound. It is crucial for communication between the mother and infant and maintaining it over uh, even when the mother is not within sight. We could say that it enables the child to exercise control over caregivers. We can surmise then that sound plays an important role in infantile narcissism and omnipotence. And this could at least in part explain the magic power sometimes attributed to music. The roots of music, therefore, lie in the archaic mental states ruled by primary processes, according to, the Freud's, to Freud's topographic model. They are unconscious, preverbal, pleasure-oriented, seeking immediate discharge of tension. Music 
activates these archaic mental states. For Ernst Chris, this was regression in the service of the ego. Gilbert Rose, a musically competent therapist, links music with interplay between primary and secondary processes. And this entails a degree of fusing of subject and object of the sensed and the sensing, echoing the original oneness with the mother. Now, and this is decisive for my argument, on Romain Rolland's suggestion, Freud called this archaic experience of the world oceanic feeling, feeling of fusion with the external world without clear distinction between the internal and external realities, as for instance, when the infant experiences its own cry as coming from the outside. It is only during later stages of development that these boundaries between I and not I become clear. Characteristic of the process of musical inspiration and composition is the ability to be open, to shift into and out of these archaic, more loosely organized states of consciousness. It is no accident that music, more often than other arts, induces aesthetic peak experience. The feeling that our own boundaries are dissolving and that we are merging with the work of art, thus approaching the primordial oceanic feeling. This relates chiefly to the listener, but similar mechanisms are involved in the creative process itself. To sum up, the link between music and the unconscious may account for creator's narcissism and omnipotence, but also for the confusion arising between the internal and external realities. Moving now to philosophy, our collocutor will be the paramount thinker of creativity, Gilles Deleuze. I begin by quoting Deleuze scholar Anne Sornac. We must stop attributing a book to an author, to a personal subject, and consider it a textual machine. Of course, we could just as well look for sound machine in music. Another scholar, Jean Vernon, studied this impersonal, asubjective aspect of Deleuze's approach, emphasizing that music liberates sonorous effects of all ties to the specific bodies whose territory they form. We also need to be reminded of Deleuze's indebtedness to Nietzsche, for whom the personal is only an expression of the impersonal will to power. To become an author is to reach this apersonal point. In order to understand this, we need first to engage with Deleuze's idea of artistic creation as a productive encounter with chaos. Art takes a bit of chaos and puts it into frame in order to form a composed chaos that becomes sensory, say Deleuze and Guattari in What is Philosophy? Chaos being not a nothingness, but a virtual containing all possible particles and drawing out all possible forms. The artist may be responsible for casting a net over chaos and be vigilant, vigilant to the possibilities that then emerge. Philosophy, science, and art share the vibratory force of the universe of chaos, says Elizabeth Gross. To harness these cosmic forces, to render invisible forces visible and inaudible forces audible, this is a task common to the painter, the musician, and the writer. Artists are furthermore inventors and creators of effects. A work of art is a monument composed of percepts, effects, and blocks of sensation. But percepts are independent of a state of those who experience them. Effects go beyond the strength of those who undergo them. Sensations, percepts, effects are beings whose validity lies in themselves and exceed any limit. They could be said to exist in the absence of man because man as he's caught in stone on the canvas or by words is himself a compound of percepts and effects. The work of art is a being of cessation. It exists in itself. In a word, as per Guattari, effect is a pre-personal category. There is another way in which creation exceeds the personal and Art for Deleuze is immediate coupling of material to sensation. It is by means of the material that <clears throat> art is able to wrest the percept from the perception 
and effect from the affection, perception and affections being associated with the personal individual. He no longer places the artist at the center, but gives material a privileged position. He talks about the percept or effect of the material itself, the smile of oil, the gesture of fired clay, the thrust of metal, the crouch of Romanesque stone, the ascent of Gothic stone. It is difficult to say where in fact the material ends and the sensation begins. This brings us to the broader questions of Deleuze's ontology. According to Barbara Bolt, he overturns the humanist tradition, which structures the human as transcendent and separate from bios and techne. Deleuze and Guattari redefine boundaries between the animal, human, and technological. In other words, being expresses the mineral, the animal, the human, the cosmic, the divine, in a single voice, on the same plane. This is a philosophy of university and immanence. <clears throat> so, clearly relying on Spinoza, whose avid reader Deleuze certainly was. We do not exist as subjects who then express themselves. Rather, life produces certain modes of expression, such as painting, writing, speaking, moving, sculpting, building, dancing, and each style of expression produces its own subject. There is no unified life or subject prior to its specific expressions. Thus, instead of an omnipotent creator, we have the art machine coupled with the subject machine, possessing, in the words of Rina Ira, of involuntary automatic expression and capable of generating its own reality beyond that associated with the particularity of the artist. By mobilizing the strategies of automatism, art is able to participate in a form of creation that is closer to autopoetic vitalism of life. Let us now proceed with a different set of questions yet still addressing the complexities of relations between the subject and object, the internal and external realities, the personal and the impersonal. How can a particular person be me? And given such a particular person as me, how is it possible to combine the perspective of that particular person inside the world with an objective view of that same world, the person and his viewpoint included? something like this. I am the center of my world um, and I contemplate this world uh, in uh, uh, which includes myself contemplating the world of which I am a part and so on and to infinity. Hardly any philosopher failed to address such questions. Had we unlimited time, we could be discussing Paul Ricoeur's questioning the autonomy of the self emphasizing that the self is constructed through the interaction with others. Or we could be discussing Wittgenstein's metaphysical subject or Husserl's transcendental ego. Or we might take a semiotic turn and question the transition between the end of world and exo world within Eroterasti's existential semiotics. And we could go back to the venerated tradition of Schelling, Hegel, and Fichte. Among many approaches, I decided to engage with the American philosopher Thomas Nagel, who in the 1970s and 80s drew considerable attention with his book, The View from Nowhere, and article, How It Is to Be a Bat. Nagel recognizes that the internal external tension pervades human life. This entails the following paradox. In order to be objective, we abandon personal perspectives, but then we cannot be object objective because these personal perspectives are also part of that same world we are trying to observe objectively. The subjective features of our minds uh, are the center of our world. We must try to conceive of them as just one of the manifestations of the mental. As a way of achieving this, Nagel postulates an instant, uh, instance he calls the objective self. To my mind, it remains somewhat unclear whether this is a factual existence, a hypothetical construct, or perhaps an ethical category, some kind of moral obligation. He teaches ethics after all. Anyhow, the objective self 
should be able to deal with experiences from any point of view. It in fact receives those of say, Miller's that cut it directly, but it treats them on an equal footing with those others it learns about only indirectly. A perspectiveless subject that constructs a centerless conception of the world by casting all perspectives into the content of that world. It requires that we find within ourselves the capacity to view the world in some sense as very different creatures also might view it when abstracting from the specifics of their types of perspective, including that and their perspective. Each of us, in addition to being an ordinary person, is a particular objective self, the subject of a perspectiveless conception of reality. The objective view must be something more something different than the totality of subjective individual views, rather than an integration of these individual views, a transcending intelligence, which can encompass all those subjective views and somehow synthesize them. What really happens in the pursuit of objectivity is that a certain element of oneself, the impersonal or objective self, which can escape the specific contingencies on one's point of view is allowed to predominate. That creates the new problem of reintegration, the problem of how to incorporate these results into the life and self-knowledge of an ordinary human being. One has to be that same creature whom one has subjected to the detached examination. In what ways is this pertinent to the topic of creativity? Artistic creation is not his principal field, but the paradoxes he discusses reflect on the way in which we make sense of creative work, perhaps even the ways in which we actually create. The creator is engaged in the most subjective activity, yet forced to appraise his or her work objectively, as if from the outside. This external assessment of my work can be twofold. The assessment that I can plausibly ascribe to other subjects, and the assessment I make in the objective mode via my objective self, to the extent that I'm able to assume the objective stance. This distinction is not clear cut, but we can say that the first is multi-centered, the second, even as the title of Nagel's book reads, the view from nowhere, centerless. The first more empirical, based on my experience with people, the second, while inevitably including experience, more theoretical. The first based primarily on my knowledge of people, which further subdivides into knowledge of particular persons and more general view of the way people judge one another, constrained by my inability or ability to assume somebody else's point of view. The second involves broader knowledge of the world, which again includes my assessment of the people. In other words, how can I think of other people judging my work as opposed to an objective impartial judgment of it? But in the first case, other people's judgments can be thought of either as subjective and partial or through their objective selves. Uh, becomes very convoluted. There is thus an attitude which cuts through the opposition between transcendent universality and parochial self-absorption. It is conspicuous as an element in aesthetic response, but it can be directed to all kinds of things, including aspects of one's own life. Very importantly, Nagel recognizes that the experience of great beauty tends to unify the self. The object engages us immediately and totally in a way that makes distinctions among points of view irrelevant. He's skeptical whether one can sustain such an attitude consistently in everyday life. It would require an immediacy of feeling and attention to what is present that does not blend well with the complex forward-looking pursuits of a civilized creature. But then, let us add, music does possess that kind of immediacy. This said, we are braced for a few concluding words. It transpires that the three rather different sets of mental coordinates, wherein we have successfully, uh, successively located ourselves, in some ways converge. The labor of the arts, 
and music in particular, is directed toward the closing of the existential gap between the subjective and objective, internal and external. The thinkers herein invoked, admittedly, concerned themselves more with the receiving than the producing, more with the receiving than the producing end with listeners, viewers, and readers rather than creators. Creation, while operating under a similar regime, carries a surplus, a kind of dark background, which remains elusive and impenetrable. And it had better remain so. We will end with a reframing of the paradox involved from a broader humanistic perspective. Music is something made by people and for people it is moreover indispensable in human life. There is no culture without music. This makes music deeply humanistic. Yet as we have somehow reached the conclusion that music is not there for us, it is the same time, at the same time, a humanistic. Humans, creators and perceivers alike are then rather like conduits for the forces of the universe, adding, a Spinozistic touch refracted through a Deleuzean prism. In place of the human subjective emotion is an inhuman intellectual love that surpasses them. The impersonal joy of God equals nature as it affirms and expresses itself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miloš, for your, as always, inspiring, insightful, and very well, clearly prepared presentation. So now I am addressing to, to the audience some questions or comments. Of course, it should be a lot of questions and comments, I think. <laughs> And may I ask, so what do you think, Milos? Will we be able sometime in the future? <laughs> with self-centered subject or in general culture, which is centered on subject, which is Western culture, in which, for example, artist uh, or composer is kind of treated as a kind of divine, <laughs> even. <laughs> or do, we, do, we, do we need to do that? I mean, with abandonment or rejection, because when we're a subject participating in the field of <laughs> still subject-centered, <laughs> and we still attribute all the things which are created to certain subject. <laughs> Do you have some, some idea how a culture will be in the future if, if this Deleuzean, um, Deleuzean force will be taken into account and somehow realized in, in ways of how we act? Uh, well, there are several things that I could say on that account. First of all, yes, it is true that um, uh, we have our Western perspective um, uh, and I admit being uh, so deeply steeped in that, deeply rooted in that, that I really cannot pretend to be able to uh, really somehow immerse myself in other traditions with all due respect and with uh, all due curiosity for that, I uh, just spontaneously think in terms of all these thinkers uh, that I'm referring to. Uh, second, uh, some of these ideas actually starting, no, Spinoza was too very important as, as a practical originator of, of, of that, um, in which uh, doesn't need a transcendent God, but somehow lays out everything on the same plane. Perhaps we are headed for that. Now, you may accuse me that I read too much science fiction, but you know, 
integrating uh, our minds via, via some kinds of interfaces and uh, um, technological, biological interface. This is not something which is, I think, with with the present state of of both biology, technology, and culture, not too far fetched. I, I mean, it's it's not it's not tomorrow. I mean, we, we are far from that, but. Uh, we can pretty much uh, envisage such a world. And it has been done, as I said, by, by primarily by science fiction authors. I think they have done that most successfully. Um, not that I'm very happy about this, and I'm, I'm very happy about being, you know, very, um, a very individual human being, and sometimes uh, uh, makes me angry when I, when I, um, read this um, <clears throat> Deleuzean ideas of being all, all, all of us expressing just the same being in the same way, but it is a fascinating thought, just the same. So I, I really admire uh, that, um, admire him as a thinker and, and other people that I, and I, have, well, I have quoted here. Thank you very much, Miloš. So, the subject and this substantialized subject is kind of Western invention and Western invention of recent centuries. Because if we look to some traditions of China, for example, there is no composer way. And I mean traditional China, China before the glo globalized world. Music belongs to everybody. You can, as, as a musician, you can add something to certain melodies and, and, and that's, that's, that's it. I believe that ethnomusicologists know that better than anyone else. Uh, you know, uh, when my good friend and, and a very eminent ethnomusicologist from, from uh, my university, when we talked about, you know, John Blacking, how musical is man and uh, how an African culture understands their music. And he said, yeah, John Blacking, you know, I wrote that book. He wrote exactly the things that I believe. And, um, but um, there we are, we, we, we are right now where we are. And uh, from this present position, we can contemplate both the present and the past constrained by, by, by the position that we assume now. So please, have some questions or comments from, from the public. It should be, I guess. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Hello, good morning. Uh, if I may, I would, ask, uh, I would like to ask you a short question. Uh, whether would you find some connection with the Jungian model of subjectivity uh, if his, I don't know, the idea of uh, the sort of regression, maybe, um, could be some sort of solution to this problem, or is there any connection, at least, with these uh, archetypes and this re resolution, maybe, of subjectivity in, in these uh, regressive sources uh, of, um, of human mind and spirituality? Uh. Uh, connection can definitely be established. Now, I didn't uh, have Jung in mind because, uh, you know, I, I've been uh, pretty much concerned with uh, these psychoanalytic perspectives and actually at this same place where, where you are now and in which I uh, couldn't make, make it this time, um, I actually twice presented papers co-authored with a psychotherapist and psychoanalyst colleague of mine. Uh, but now I insist that uh, my whole idea is actually going over Gilbert Rose and Stuart Feather and uh, then back Stanley Friedman and uh, Ernst Chris and, and back to, to Freud. Um, it's really more Freudian oriented. Uh, and um, I'm not so comfortable with you, although, as, as, as you said, you can very well uh, 
think in terms of archetypes, in terms of the collective unconscious. Uh, uh, is, it is uh, a bit different approach, which uh, doesn't seem to contradict, contradict anything that I have said here. Very much, Milos. Thank you very much for your questions and comments. And now we have to proceed. And let me to invite the next speaker, Martina Stratilkova from Palatsky University in Czech Republic. That's oh, Martina, please welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm honored to be here, to be really here with you also and with all of you who are online. And I would like to speak a little bit about uh, two conceptions of some, okay, thank you some discussion or interplay between uh, between what is a part of the tradition and what goes uh, against it. Uh, so I would like to recall the theory of a compositional style change which was presented by Leonard B. Mayer and would like to confront it uh, and compare uh, with uh, aesthetic theory of Jan Mukarzowski who was a uh, Czech aesthetician who uh, is quite recognized um, also in abroad and uh, has some recognition within the structuralist uh, aesthetics and some later literature, mainly uh, literary uh, theory. Uh, Leonard B. Mayer uh, was a prominent American musicologist who also studied philosophy and composition. Uh, this erudition was the basis of his scholarship in musical aesthetics, in which he was particularly interested in the dynamics of stylistic change or the evolution of musical styles. The implications of his theories then flowed into music history, music aesthetics, and to some extent music psychology, as well as music theory. The key point of many of these considerations of his lies in expectation, a moment of experiencing music that takes place in the interaction between the mental efforts of the perceiver and the musical structure of the work, all against the background of a historical, historically changing schema. And Jan Mukarzowski, who lived in 1891 and uh, 19. 75 was a Czech structuralist, uh, aesthetician, literary theorist, and historian. He was concerned with the theoretical interpretation of key aesthetic categories, such as functions and value, and he devoted specific analyses to, for example, the artistic style of selected authors, as well as to analyses of individual works, especially literary works, but also other works of uh, almost all art forms except music. He also fundamentally influenced the further development of structuralism into a form of reception aesthetics. The axis of his reflections is the interaction between the collective and the individual subject, namely between meanings stabilized by tradition and meanings more variably bound to specific agents of art like author and perceiver from which the formation of the meaning of the artwork grows. How these interactions take place, what is their contribution and the scheme of historical transformation seen in the interaction of these two culturally distant thinkers is then the subject of my paper. Uh, first, however, uh, some um, brief discussion of the intellectual background of both thinkers. Jan Mukarzowski, as I already told you, was a representative of the structuralism of the 1930s and 1940s, who was also inspired by, for example, Russian from a school or phenomenology. He was not too far from the form formalist aesthetics of the 19th century. According to him, structuralist aesthetics ranks among the objectivist movements, that is, those which take the aesthetic object, that is, the work that is the work of art, as the starting point, but, does not, but not the sole aim of their investigation. 
At the same time, he is characterized by an interest in semiotic analysis and in those artistic species that can clearly represent the external world. The intellectual position of Leonard B. Meyer, introduced with the influential publication Emotion and Meaning in Music in 1956. It can be described as, uh, or he can be described, uh, described as expressivist formalist. He too clearly tends toward an exploration of meaning, but here it is important to ask how he defines meaning. He distinguishes between designative meaning and embodied meaning. While something is meaningful in the designative sense, when, uh, he says, it indicates or refers to something which is different from itself in kind, it refers outside music, embodied meaning indicates or refers to something which is like itself in kind. He clearly says that his study is concerned with those meanings which arise within the context of the work itself. And now I would like to introduce my paper chronologically with the earlier aesthetic theory of Jan Mokarovsky, who, among other things, characterized art by dynamic relations between intentionality and unintentionality. A work of art is the result of human creativity, which is driven by the desire to enrich it with aesthetic qualities. It would follow, therefore, that it is the result of an entirely deliberate effort. This idea would also be underlined by the fact that while objects of practical use certainly fulfill the requirement of intentionality, since their creation is guided by the efforts to make them so that they perform certain functions in their application, some of their characteristics are completely indifferent to the fulfillment of this function and are not taken into account in the creation of the object. So in the creation of the work of art, we get the impression of supreme intentionality. For in a work of art, not a single feature of the object, he says, not a single detail of its information is beyond the reach of attention. The work of art fulfills its purpose of being an aesthetic sign as an integral whole. Through the history of aesthetic thought, this concept has been explored as the participation of the unconscious or subconscious. In Plato, for example, as a creative madness descending from the gut through the muse to the poet and subsequently to the audience of the poems recited. The necessary role of the unconscious in artistic creation then became established in the Romantic period and was reinforced by later approaches, most notably, of course, psychoanalysis. However, this psychological connection does not establish the concept of artistic unintentionality. In emphasizing uh, the functional uh, closeness of the work of art to external goals, we can discern the argument of traditional aesthetics residing, sorry, okay, residing in Immanuel Kant's concept of disinterestedness. The work is not a means to end, but an end in itself. Unless we count the enrichment of our spiritual life, which is only possible, however, as Schiller also said, if it is autonomous. In order to understand intentionality and unintentionality, we should not primarily focus on the author, but on the recipient, which is also the author himself. If he relates to his creation as a work of art, if he enters the role of the perceiver, because a work of art is above all a sign, a career of meaning. At the same time, uh, the nature of the sign, or the semiotic nature of the work of art, it's being assigned, is realized by communicating a complex relationship to reality and does not convey an unambiguous factual relationship to certain aspects of reality as we see, for example, in the communicative unit of a sentence. Here, then, we return to the idea that as a sign, the work of art functions only as a whole. Thus, if we approach an artifact as a work of art, we are, as it were, automatically trying to find in the structure of the work traces of an arrangement that would allow us to conceive the work of art as a meaningful whole, says Mokarovsky.
It is only in the active interaction of the perceiver with the work that some aspects of the work are constituted as intentional and some as unintentional. And this determination may differ from that which may have characterized the experience or the reception of the work at the time of its creation. Thus, the determination of uh, intentional and unintentional undergoes transformations resulting from socio-cultural, historical and other contextual changes. The question also arises as to whether artistic unintentionality lies if the spontaneous attitude of the perceiver seeks to reveal the unified meaning of the work. The intentionality that the perceiver puts into the work is induced by the intentional construction of the work. The way in which the author conceived the unity of the work by intentionality is not binding for the recipient. He exercises his own initiative, the aim of which is therefore the unification of meaning, which, however, does not happen smoothly, as Mukarovsky says. There may be contradictions between the meanings of the individual components, but this can still be overcome within the framework of intentionality. I quote now, when the perceiver is able to bind the contradictory components in a synthesis, their contradiction appears as an internal contradiction, one of the internal contradictions of the poetic structure in question. In the latter case, the contradiction remains outside the structure. And it is intentionality, a unity of meaning, a semantic gesture, as Mokarovsky would say, which, if detected, uh, gives the impression of an artifact, an artificially produced sign, whereas unintentionality is part of our life's raw reality. A description that Mukarovsky further adds is like tearing an immediate rapture, an urgency that arises from the fact that it distracts from the work, it involves in its enchantment what is external to it, such as the listener's inward personal experience of the recipient. He says, it gives the work an urgency for the perceiver that could not be achieved by a mere sign behind every feature of which the perceiver would feel the intention of someone other than himself. The development of style, however, brings about a transformation in the determination of the unintentional, which is in fact gradually integrating integrated within the historical process into the inner unified meaning of the work of art. Even the intentional may later, may later become unintentional, but in general the development of artistic movement is characterized by an increasingly close relationship to reality. Now I switch to Leonard B. Mayer's theory. Especially in his book Music, the Arts and Ideas, and at the same time, in connection with the aforementioned title, Emotion and Meaning in Music, he bases on the assumption that our whole mental existence is built around our expectations about the normal or probable continuity of events, and that such expectations become active, either as affective experience or conscious cognition, only when our normal patterns of behavior are disturbed in some way. Here, too, we learn more about his conception of meaning, in which he distinguishes essentially according to its being conscious. Indeed, in his first book, he has already made this clear. He says that the formalist's conception of musical experience and the expressionist's conception of it appear as complementary rather than contradictory positions. Emotion and meaning are just different ways of experiencing the same thing. Whether emotion or consideration prevails in the final experience is up to the listener, up to whether he objectifies it into conscious meaning. Thus, Meyer attributes ignorance to emotional experience, noting that although intellectual activity may take place outside conscious control, intellectual satisfaction presupposes self-consciousness. In yet another place, Mayer then states, meaning arises when an individual becomes aware, either effectively or intellectually, of the implications of a stimulus in a particular context. 
Musical meanings are constituted in the context of musical style, styles, which he defines as internalized probability systems. The constitution of style is based on internalized norms, the gradual formation of habitual responses, and just whether the musical experience follows the expected pattern of habitual responses or whether they are delayed or blocked. He says that as long as behavior is habitual, the stimuli presented to the mind are neither meaningful nor meaningless. Because the musical community has internalized its norms, compositions in the style can be and usually are less uh, redundant. To put the matter in another way, the amount of musical information that the community can comprehend and the speed with which it can do so is a function both of the extent of internalized, meaning cultural redundancy, that is the depth and strength of stylistic learning, and of the amount of compositional structural redundancy presented by a particular work, that is its objective order and regularity. In any case, it is obvious that redundancy is supported by the elements of repetition which give regularity to the structure and reduce uncertainty. However, if we can predict very well, music will not enrich us with new meanings. High redundancy does not challenge us and does not have a very high semantic potential. Mayer also posited a historical dynamic of meaning formation in the degree of redundancy that musical styles exhibit. Compositional redundancy decreases as the style develops, while internalized or cultural redundancy gradually increases. One can doubt whether Mayer really needs the terminology of information theory when he himself states that embodied meaning and information arise out of the same processes. Uh, the differentia between them lies not in the nature of the processes involved but in the psychological attitude taken toward the processes. The thing is that, according to Mayer, in meaning, the musical process is considered and evaluated from the viewpoint of antecedents. In information, the same processes are examined and assessed from the viewpoint of consequence. So it is the difference between the relation to the musical flow that has passed and the relation to the musical flow that we expect to follow. Mayer then considers whether redundancy in contemporary music has fallen below a critical threshold. Cultural noise is also involved, namely the mismatch between the habitual responses demanded by a musical style and those available to the listener. And so Mayer argues that in their zeal to pack music full of meaning, some contemporary composers have perhaps so overloaded the channel capacity of the audience that one meaning obscures another in, an, in the ensuing overview, overflow. Sorry. He even spoke of desirable and undesirable uncertainty, which differ in that we either have a finite set of possibilities or we do not have these possibilities. On this point, Mayer also stirred up some controversy as he quite clearly attacked the serial music. However, his attack can be considered understandable if, we, if it is seen in the context of his theory of the development of contemporary music. For Mayer state that history is neutralized, it is irrelevant as it deviates from the paradigm, meaning the paradigm of style history and cultural change. Instead, what comes is a fragmented world of fluctuating stasis, a sort of dynamic steady state. In a pluralistic musical culture, new styles are certainly emerging, but there is little chance that any one of them will take the lead. With the fragmentation of creativity, the audience is fragmenting as well. These far-reaching trends of globalizing world will be commented on by a number of thinkers a little later. But I will at least remind, remind you of Arnold Gehlen, according to whom we have entered the age of post-histoire. He says, from now on, there is no further inherent artistic development. With the kind of logical sense, art history is over, even the consequence of absurdity. Development is completed, and what comes next is already there. 
the syncretism of the mixture of all styles and options post historal Art in its original form is losing its function. Its pre preservation is mainly due to the fact that over the centuries it has become deeply embedded in the functioning of a society that does not want to give it up. For conclusion, I can say that both Mukashevsky and Meyer, um, we can say that they presented an immanentist conception of music history or art history. Meyer was speaking about internal or even inherent dynamic processes. Mukashevsky about an artistic structure that develops itself in a continuous series. According to them, the historical development of music or art in general is characterized by a variable proportion of components that support artistic coherence and components that deny it. Both authors illustrate this with selected artistic new movements. Sometimes intentionality is more emphasized, sometimes unintentionality. Illuminating here may also be the definition of music as given by Andrew Kenya who says that music is first, an event intentionally produced or organized, second, to be heard, and third, either, A, to have some basic musical feature, such as pitch or rhythm, or B, to be listened for such features. Kenya distinguishes between two, or we can say that Kenya distinguishes between two traditions of music, as does Mukashevsky, who attributes the idea of a unification of meaning to a certain way of conceiving art. Perhaps we should proceed in this way, even if we try to evaluate the contribution of the thesis on the interplay between internalized and compositional redundancy and the extent of its validity, if any. So, thank you. <laughs> That's all for me. Thank you very much, Martin, for your exciting presentation and for revealing some unknown aspects of aesthetician from Czech Republic and concepts of Leonard B. Mayer. So, and it should be some questions or comments from public, definitely. Milos, you always have something to ask. <laughs> so, because as I see that the topic, the considerations somehow are related to your considerations as well, because it, it deals with the same mechanisms of, of yes, as, as she clarified, redundancy and certain structure. And again, like in Deleuze and says, paranoic or schizophrenical move. So <laughs> it should be some relation. I'm sure you, you may have some questions. <laughs> no? Ah, sorry, we, we cannot hear you. Your microphone. Your microphone, yes, yes. Yeah, I'm not allowed to unmute, so you, you have to do that for yourself. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Particularly, uh, I would, it was very interesting for me that you were mentioning Mukherjowski. I'm not really familiar with that, but um, uh, I, I remember it was some 40 years ago that um, a translation of, of his book uh, something like structure, sign, value, yeah, yeah. you know what, I, I don't exactly remember. And I, I actually read it back then, never got back to it, so I, I don't really remember very much. I, I wonder how, how well is he known uh, uh, outside, I mean, in, in the West, for example, has it ever been translated into English or German, French or something? Um, uh, anyhow, I wonder, you mention intentionality very often. Uh, I sense that uh, you're actually using that word uh, in, in, in this usual everyday sense, like you have an intention, so that's something intentional. Uh, uh, not in the sense like Husserl use it in uh, mind being about something. Uh, can you? at least confirm that or clarify the, the, this concept. Yeah, I'm afraid mm -hmm. that uh, yeah, this meaning of, of this term intentionality is really specific 
and it, it is done by, uh, by the opposition to this kind of uh, definition of unintentionality. So uh, this, uh, this polarity of this uh, intentionality and unintentionality makes uh, the whole concept. Uh, and uh, what should be uh, what should be meant as being intentional in the work of art is something which uh, which um, which does make sense in the work of art, which makes it being uh, being uh, experienced as as united or being unified. So uh, the conception of intentionality uh, within the structuralist uh, school is quite closely connected uh, with the object. Uh, um, yeah, it's not um, it's not meant to be absolutely not a psychological concept and even not a phenomenological concept, but really a concept um, describing uh, describing. Uh, the work of art, its, it's structure, uh, it's it being object mm. uh, for us to, to analyze it, I would say. Or uh, there's also uh, the aspect of rece reception theory, because in the interaction uh, between the structure of the work, between the object uh, and the perceiver, uh, there, uh, the intentionality is being constituted. Yeah. So there, there is a sort of uh, phenomenological thinking, I, I think, maybe in this interaction, uh, interaction and maybe this constitution of uh, the unified sense of the, of the work. But maybe, maybe this constitution, maybe there could be some connection with, with phenomenology. Yes. Could be, um, and just, just one small thing. Um, do you see any, any connection, you know, uh, this uh, aspects of, of Leonard Mayer uh, in relation, let's say, for to, to the more recent uh, uh, investigations like David Huron, sweet anticipation, uh, sweet anticipation, anticipation, <laughs> yeah. Oh, mm. well, this concept of sweet anticipation is really uh, strongly connected to to emotions. Uh, to uh, affective experience uh, uh, in a very concrete uh, sense. Sure, it's, it's really connected to expectancy. So I suppose that uh, finally, after some analysis, there should be some connection because expectation is, is uh, very strongly um, present uh, in this concept of uh, sweet anticipation. So, so maybe, yeah, it could be applied or, or uh, connected. But generally, this, this is a sort of speculative aesthetics or objectivist uh, theoretical aesthetics. And this is empirical investigation. So there always is a, uh, is a gap uh, in the methodologies. But yeah, I think that the connections and interdisciplinary is growing yeah, between these empirical sciences and, and the philosophy. So perhaps. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Too. There, there thank will be a uh, real discussion could uh, ensue once we once uh, we we really read the paper. Uh, this might be a bit superficial, but okay. uh, yeah. oh, thank you. Good. Anyway, thank you. Anyway, I, I'm looking forward to, to reading. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your presentation too. Thank you very much, Milos, for your good questions and comments. Thank you very much, Martina, for your presentation. And now we will invite our guest from Goldsmiths University in London. I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing name properly. Alastair. Alastair White. So please, contingency dialectics in fashion opera. And as far as I see, you will speak about your works as well here. So it's very interesting to hear from a composer's perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello. I just one second while I set up my slide. Uh, if I can remember how to do this. Um, yes. That was that was just literally the pressing random buttons approach and second second button I got it. So yes. Uh, So, yeah, and share, share screen. Uh, 
Does, can everyone see that? Is that? Yeah, cool. To full screen mode. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, hello. Um, uh, that's okay? Yeah, everyone can hear me. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'll take these off. Yeah, my name is Alistair. Um, I'm going to be speaking about my work over the past four years, um, creating a series of four uh, fashion operas. And today I'm primarily going to be speaking about the theory behind it or the theory that it's based upon um, contingency dialectics. Um, these are uh, four works produced since 2018, um, starting with Ware in 2018 with uh, the designer Derek Lawler, um, uh, followed by Robe in 2019 as a collaboration with the designer Michael Stewart as well as Tommy Jong, some of the um, pictures from the shows here. Um, uh, in 2019, Wode, um, with uh, the designer Renly Su, which is, was produced over the pandemic and is actually uh, next weekend, touch wood, uh, touch wood, having its real life premiere in uh, Maastricht. Um, and finally, Rune this year, um, which was produced uh, with the designers Kawaki and at the Hackney Round Chapel. Uh, some of the designs here. Is that working? Okay, great. Um, um, I'm not going to play any excerpts of them because for such, I found, you know, sometimes playing excerpts of such pluralistic works is um, obscures more than it elucidates, but I could maybe um, send, send them around to the delegates uh, via Andres. I'll see, see if we can do that. Um, so what, what is fashion opera? Fashion opera is a methodology uh, built on irreconcilable paradox. In this uh, spatial interventionist art forms, such as fashion, but also dance, um, combined with temporal uh, autonomous counterparts, such as opera, music, um, poetry also, in a dialogue that attempts to reconcile the independence and hierarchical equality of each element with their integration into a logical whole. So that is, um, fashion and opera, for instance, preserve their absoluteness with neither submitting uh, to the other to become mere costume or, or musical aura. Um, the, the philosopher Alan Badu talks of the irreconcilability of dance to theatre or music due to their fundamental ontological differences. I argue that such mutual exclusivity um, of, of these art forms involved can gain a radical potential uh, via the concept of the contingent dialectic. Uh, this idea extends throughout to govern all aspects of the artwork, including its realisation across and beyond the compositional process. So as I say, the maintenance of such a paradox is justified by the theory of a particular type of antagonism. Um, sorry, um, a contingent dialectic. So in this, each pole of an opposition maintains its identity and integrity in mutual exclusivity while simultaneously being made to reciprocally contain one another and to be contained within larger structures uh, that permit the paradoxical integrity of their constituents. Um, through, the, through these concepts and their application across all stages of the aesthetic process, it's hoped that work can be produced and which rival and overcome given structures of perception and allow for new forms of communal agency in a post-human uh, contingent subjectivity. Um, that is, a transhuman agent composed of technology, i.e. texts, and individuals. Um, it is to this, the group and its situation, that the works attempt to address themselves. Um, while it's composed of alienated individual perspectives, these are held to be ultimately a social and biological fiction that can only be transcended in their combination and reassembly. Um, by mutually exclusive, I'm referring to the Hegelian conception of the dialectic, which sees an epistemological antagonism as an index of truth. Uh, this is read through contemporary cosmology, that is, in the hermeneutic concepts made possible by notions such as the superposition or the multiverse. And here I'm referring to the cultural possibilities that the ability to imagine such a relationship makes possible. 
So ours is a world still in the grip of an outdated Newtonian metaphysics, and I'm interested in how such knowledge could transform music society, even ourselves. Um, this is supplemented by the work of Alan Badu, who I've referred to, but also Quinton Meazu and a, a Marxist theory of time under late capitalism, which together argue for the material truth of paradox and non-causality as the nature of the external world and indeed our contemporary socially determined subjective experience. Um, finally, reciprocal containment uh, refers to both a characteristic of the structures of experience and therefore of certain artworks. Um, in this latter, I proceed from a reading of the historical trajectory of Western art music through postmodern conceptions of decentering and multiplicity. That is, the heart of what we might call the Western canonical trajectory is a freedom of phenomenological perspective where points within the work function simultaneously as both object and context. That is, they sim simultaneously contain and are contained by one another. Um, particularly in the music of Brian Ferniehoe, through the separation of parameter, the very aspects of the musical event become events or objects themselves, and within this function is context for one another's progress. Uh, fashion opera develops this tradition by taking the radical separation of musical parameter as well as the importance given to different moments in the work's compositional history and applying them across the dramatic arts. Um, so this, the project contextualizes itself against what it considers to be two primary errors in political, political music. Firstly, uh, that resistance may constitute anything less than transcendence. Um, I'm, particularly Adorno's essay, Commitment, has argued how, well, I think shown how there's no way out of capitalism with the givenness of perception by finding it hand to hand in places, piece by piece. Um, it will always adapt and subsume the strategy within itself. Uh, secondly, and especially when attempting such transcendence, that it assumes the limits of the social. Um, Contemporary music is unforgivably content with its position, even in attempting such Adornian autonomy, uh, with what Lachman calls a complete, as what Lachman calls a complacently tolerated ghetto. Um, Meizu's concept of contingency here on the on the slide um, represents a declaration that everything is always possible. Uh, the challenge of this idea is that there is nothing less than the proximity of revolution, the knowledge that even tonight, the world could change utterly into a beautiful, wonderful thing for all. Um, what has not been considered is that this is exactly what is at hand. Um, the postmodern spatialization of time and the modernist alienation from which it arises foreground the possibility of contingency in our historical moment by embedding non-relation and disjunction as fundamental constituents of the contemporary individual and defining its relationship to itself, its others, and its world. As capital splits the subject into a paradox of mutually exclusive pieces, depending on the task that they are instructed to perform, a mouth, a hand, an ear, a significant experiential ground arises. This has already been alluded to by the philosopher Reza Negrestani, who contrasts the openness that comes from the outside against negotiated economical openness. I read this polemic as claiming that the exteriority of transcendence is not achieved through false claims to liminality or compromise, but rather submit the submission of the individual to its non-human alienation. That is, the contingent subject becomes possible in a society where the social fiction of the individual is both absolute and absolutely disproven. This is given pressing relevancy by the historical ground of the coming stage of capital, uh, which in its quantum technological revolution unveils the fiction model within its cultural dominant. I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Um, and finally, it's justified by the ontological ground of Cantor, whose dem demonstration of multiple infinities forms the basis of Alan Badu's ontology of multiple processive truths. Taken together, these allow for the possibility of mutually exclusive reciprocal containment and in turn, the contingent dialectic. In these, we may conceive of the unimaginable, that which lies outside the givenness of ourselves. The quantum computer heralds a dramatic change in our relationship to reality. Capital's normalization of quantum weirdness from, specialized, from specialist knowledge to everyday use value will have far-reaching superstructural effects. 
The first, uh, to quote um, Dowling and Milburn here, um, the first quantum revolution gave us new rules that govern physical reality. The second quantum revolution will take these rules and use them to develop new technologies. Sorry. Uh, to this should be added, uh, those technologies in turn will create a revolution in culture and thought via the establishment of their own cultural logic, um, to reference Jameson. As subtle, nuanced and reciprocal as we know the base superstructure relationship to be, the vulgar Marxist insight that the modes of production are the ultimate determinants of cultural experience is essential here in its austere understanding. For as technological forces incorporate extra perceptual transcendence, it allows us to read the stage of capital defined by quantum technology as a moment of great opportunity for reimagining aesthetic form and the limits of the possible. I hold that the, coming, uh, the nature of this coming epoch demands artists propose a model of how their work intervenes within the structures of experience. Uh, although there are as yet no conclusive descriptions of our universe to satisfy Marxist aesthetics fully, what there is agreement upon among a majority of physicists is that there exists an external physical reality completely independent of us humans. Following Tegmark, I accept that this entails the demand for a distinction between the external reality described by recent scientific advances and the consensus reality of evolutionary determined human perception. The resultant unknowability of that external reality is the nexus of the contradiction between idealism and materialism, and it's through a reformulation of this principle that such transcendence can be grounded in revolutionary possibility. Uh, the critic K.K. Thekadath responded to quantum physics problematization of the concept of object reality by arguing that rather than returning to uh, idealist notions of unknowability, we should instead apprehend quantum noumena through the dynamic relational approach of dialectical materialism. T.J. Araman developed this further by impressing the problems of idealism's answers to quantum science by emphasizing its ideological function as bourgeois philosophy to distort truth and prevent change. However, if we take Tegmark's argument that the unknowability of reality is evolutionarily determined by the practical demands of Darwinian selection, we can, reform, we can reformulate the concept of unknowability as instead imper imperceptibility, which figures the limits of essential understanding as themselves part of a knowable process of evolution. Extending the domain of knowledge as a widespread cultural dominant beyond the realms of the immediate and the individual would be the great prize of the second quantum revolution, that is, the death of post-truth, an inversion of this where the individual divines truth as its limited selected knowledge and the Newtonian liberal subject monad, uh, which encompasses the lie of the individual as a rational, complete perspective. And indeed, um, Thekadeth and Jaraman's insistence that physics adopt dialectical materialism carries as much truth when posited the other way around. Uh, Marx's critiques must necessarily incorporate aspects of the idealist tradition or, by emphasising consensus over external reality, become idealist uh, denials of scientific knowledge themselves. Um, Stephen G. Brush has shown how the historical irony of culture-bound accustomedness to mechanistic materialism has brought about the same cultural resistance to scientific theory that idealist religiosity had to Copernicus and Galileo's materialism. The Marxist theory of the aesthetic should be no different, a philosophy that attempts a utopian ideal through the demystification of false consciousness must incorporate this layer of illusion into its framework. In doing so, we can construct a model of imposed fictions that arbitrate our relationship to reality. Now, this differs uh, from similar transcendental materialism, such as that of Zizek or Adrian Johnson, in that at its heart, this is nothing more than a structuralist Marxist politics redefining itself via the stage of capital represented by the quantum computer. Thus, Louis Althusser's concept of ideology as the reproduction of the relations of production through the imposition of false consciousness upon the subject must ultimately be dependent upon the subject's psychology, uh, with Daniel Kahneman's work has revealed to be an evolutionary determined machine of necessity that employs processes which privilege preformed bias over rational inquiry. Psychological bias is therefore inseparably linked to the imposed ideology by which the economic base re uh, reproduces superstructural beliefs in its citizens. 
uh, because it is the same evolutionary necessity that is ultimately responsible for the collapsing of external reality into consensus reality, all three levels can be understood to be interrelated to the point of dependence, working together to work to weave an intricate series of imposed fictions which the subject experiences. That is, a Marxist conception of ideological fiction can no longer be limited to the social sphere, but extends into the flesh, the bowels, the double helix, the most basic units of identity's data on an evolutionary rather than historical temporal scale. This is not to assert a biological determinism. Catherine Malibu has shown the reciprocal interplay between the social, psychological and biological, even genetic, allowing for us to conceive of this reciprocity as a site of intervention. Materialist analysis leads, via recent cosmological discovery, to the idealist division of the subject from the real. I call this expanded scheme of false consciousness the fiction model. By expanding the concept of false consciousness in this way, we can understand the discrepancy between external and consensus reality itself as being a locus of the forces of emancipation and subjugation, dictated by hard-won truth and conditioned falsehood. The axiom that there are certain kinds of knowledge which we must at all costs obtain in order to be free, thus loses its historical relativity. Nietzsche's understanding that the consequences of the confines of our subjectivity must themselves be surmounted is giving new meaning through a Marxist appropriation of a historically reinvigorated Kantianism, where the subject lies not in divided and distinguished worlds, but at the anoretic intersection between the two, where blindness and insight, emancipation and subjugation, subjection are mutually constitutive. This, the contradiction at the, is of this, the contradiction of the Kantian idealist materialist split is the contingency at the heart of the second quantum revolution. The advent of such a moment allows us to collapse both traditions into a theory of the artwork as a political event. Self-actualization, dependent upon knowledge, occurs in the interplay between subject and object, a process which is arbitrated by evolutionary biological and socio-ideological processes, and freed from these by creative practices that resist the passive inheritance of necessity. Art, can, art is the most important of these because of its reconciliation of the individual to the social within a practice that is primarily concerned with the subject-object division and relationship, allowing it to engage with the fiction model at every level, from the limits of experience and an awareness of their modalities, through sensation and bias to reason. The concept of freedom as defined against the fiction model's necessity thus becomes a measurement of revolutionary and aesthetic value. To be clear, this is absolutely not a teleological appeal to the extra aesthetic, as used by much modern political art to justify its own absence of value. Rather, the aesthetic and the political align in the fiction model's transplantation of the aesthetic into the political sphere, and vice versa. The aesthetic is political. Politics occurs at the level of the aesthetic. Thus, art can be seen as a dialectical process towards the imperceptible that transforms the material world, ourselves included, by rendering the indiscernible imminent. As Badu so memorably puts it, the all-powerfulness of a truth is merely that of changing what is. So, to present a manifesto of the contingent subject, following water, um, defining terms as the individual is that which is imposed by non-human structural necessity. The subject is that which is freely created in an ongoing process of self-actualization and a totality as a complete, exclusive and foreclosed situation that can combine mutually exclusive elements within it. The individual experiences a totality of imposed fictions and is composed of their sedimentation into constitutive fictions. The imposed fictions are a negation of reality and combine into a series of totalities through the establishment of rigorous imminent structure that incorporates their contradictory elements. Art is a fiction which, when operating under the same mechanics, may function as a negation of those very fictions. A structurally cohesive and imminently complete artwork that contains and justifies its own contradictions can function as an aesthetic totality beyond and out with the social totality in which non-conditioned encounters can take place. Such art, operates, such art operates as a negation of the imposed fictions, negation of reality to reveal the positive content of that negation, thereby moving us to the limits of our phenomenal experience. Freedom, and therefore subjectivity, is possible through the restructuring of the structures that create us as unfree. Transcendental intersubjectivity here gains new life 
as the imposed fiction's filtration of external reality into constitutive fictions. Communities of observers share different elements of consensus reality and ideological interpolation, while at the same time being constructed as absolutely separate from one another by that same biological construction and historically determined social conditioning. In the artwork, we gain the possibility of transcendental community in our constitutive fictions being engaged and overcome. The artwork of the future is that in which the subject is reassembled by being incorporated into a community of meaning creation, from individual to a constituent of a machine that reveals the arbitrary nature of imposed individuality. That is, an aesthetic totality can function as a social totality by recombining mutually exclusive wholes, human and aesthetic, within it. Structural imminence gives this meaning. This imminence can organize information too great to be apprehended by a single consciousness and allow it to contain structural breaks and arbitrary elements as fundamental constituents of truth. Functioning in this way, the aesthetic totality can incorporate the individuals perceiving it within its structure as a fundamentally necessary for its meaning production and therefore integral to form. Combining mutually exclusive individuals outside of the social totality creates the possibility of a, form of, a new form of subjectivity, an intersection of technology, texts, artworks and individuals. What will be termed the contingent subject, a transubjective agent assembled from multiple semiotic and psychological structures through aesthetic procedures. Negation of imposed fiction occurs simultaneously in the assembly of, assembly of individuals into a transubjective agent. That is, truth and community are as processes, indistinguishable. Fashion opera is an attempt to make these ideas work in practice, in form, structure, pitch, rhythmic material, poetic language, narrative, characterization, and collaborative theatrical practice. Um, to look at this in greater detail, I'm gonna briefly explore elements from our opera robe, um, seen here from the 20, 2019 production. At the core of the work structure is a set of relationships that emphasize the antagonisms implied by my above statement between the one and the many, between plurality and imminence, between structure and contingency, and between temporality and spatialization. Rob puts this tradition to work on questions regarding the implications of AI and virtual reality, exploring the ideas outlined above regarding how multiple realities are layered upon one another to produce a composite of jostling stimuli, and how collaboration and community can perhaps create, by combining individuals through the ancient technology of artworks, a form of artificial superintelligence. Such questions evoke the dialectic between the human and the non-human at the work's contentious and philosophical core. Where in questions of performability, biological limits collide with demands of structural processes. These latter are at the heart of the work's claim to realizing its ambitions. It maintains that by rivaling the nature of the structures of imposed fiction, it can negate them as part of the creation of what was termed the contingent subject. In this way, it takes the only uh, old 12 note, oh, yeah, sorry. It takes all the own 12 note all interval mirror chords, which are those which contain a tritone at their center and repeat their intervals in a version on either side, either as perfect retrograde or perfect re repeat. Uh, these chords generate three opposing structures, namely a matrix of chords derived from Belazian multiplication, as well as a related matrix of the same chords polychordally stacked, uh, intervelically defined Carterian character rows and their derivations and polychords and their constituent triads and tonal associations. For instance, A, a, star, a one star prime transposed to C contains a polycard of F minor and A major, which gives a negative or remainder of uh, 8, 11, 8, 8, 11, which can be extended into an intervallically characteristic row of 8, 11, 8, 8, 11, 6, 8, 11, 8, 8, 11, 8. Um, all of which in turn transform into one another in that each mirror chord contains a polychord in intervallically defined row. Each intervallically defined row contains one of the multiplication matrices, domain tetrachords. The domain tetrachords imply polychords and furthermore the primarily multipli prim primary multiplication structure may transform into the derived chords from the intervallically defined rows and into polychords through the polychordal stacking or addition of its domain tetrachords. Thus the structure itself is an object in motion defined by opposition, negativity and contingency, but also logic, meaning and lines of relation. 
Um, these three structures are not merely ways of organizing and generating pitch, but apply three fundamentally opposed, that is exclusive, understandings of the phenomenology of music, which, is nev which nevertheless may be composed of, that is, contain one another. Um, intervallic techniques sees pitch as an edge used to define a space, a procedure in which the listener's apprehension is paramount. Uh, multiplication sees it as a point or a material object that exists out with human perception. Uh, whereas tonally based triadic groupings imply a historical tradition which sees them as components of a functional system such as a grammar, like a grammar. By interweaving not only these techniques but the ideologies and interpretive mechanisms they imply and thus affecting various levels of establishment, dissolution and combination, the, the work gains what I believe to be a considerably effective tool in its creation of structures that rival those of imposed social, psychological and biological fictions. So to conclude, it's hoped that Taking together these interlocking strategies of music, poetry, and drama through their logic and contradiction, structure and chaos, presence and absence, create a paradox that can rival the truth of our world, and then in doing so, they may overcome the horror and control of that world's present structures to allow a space whereby utopia still, or even now, could be imagined to exist. Art's relationship to the present is identical to that of the future. The space that this future traverses is both contained and excluded by the structures of our own time. It is in their negativity, their defeat, their disproving, their unimagining, that they become immediately and significantly real. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alastair. It was a really very dense text, a yes, lot sorry. of inspiring quotations, and I am surprised, actually, about integrity of your work, composer and thinker. So it seems that you involve these thinkers to justify your approach to composition as well. Mm. And you should feel somehow very sure because you are doing right things. <laughs> you present it as a kind of true and it can justify your compositions as well, right? Yeah, um, well, uh, is that, is that a question? Yes, that's, that's a comment or question, so I don't mm. know. But. Well, I just, um, I, I, I'm only a, I've only become a composer recently in the last, well, I think, you know, five years or so, something like that. I was originally, um, I used to play piano in a band. That was, that was my thing. And it was... I know it, so, it sounds quite often when, when artists talk about their work, it's off, you know, it's, it's difficult to take the philosophy of it seriously. And I understand also with my own work, you know, it sounds like, you know, you have the thing and then you justify it. The, my only defense of that is that the, the ideas came first before I could compose. And it was more that, how, how do you do that? How do you put that into perspective? You can't, you can't really do that as a member of a band. You know, or, or I couldn't do it as, as an improviser in a band. Um, it needed to be something that you worked with people in a slightly different way. You know, as a, you, I suppose as a, that your practice was um, exclusive, but also combined with other mutually exclusive practices. And so I had to develop it in that way. So, um, Yes, obviously, it's, you could, it's still difficult to take any, any artist talking about philosophy seriously because it's self-justification, self-aggrandization to an extent, but uh, that would be my one defense against it. That's not a problem. We always, as a composer, we look for some justification, and your justification is very convincing. You're kind of, in the Lausian sense, schizophrenical composer. <laughs> yes, so you don't listen. You do not, do not think about acoustic result. You just construct some things, put different lines, different layers, each on other, and you have your result, right? That's your way of approach to composition, to composing. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Uh, the only, um, although that itself is, uh, is att attempts to be layered. So again, there's uh, Fernie Ho's idea of depth perspective. Um, you know, I don't know if people aren't aware of it. It's the idea that each, each layer of the work has its own kind of complete imminence. So that the pre-compositional object and the score and the perform, I mean, this is a simplification of it, but these might all be equally, you know, said to be the actual object, ob object themselves in a multiplicity. So I kind of, uh, I, I think that's a really particularly interesting idea for theater. And what it means that you can incorporate also the kind of st structuralist aspect of your work, which is, and the pre-compositional planning that is completely against acoustic, but also, uh, you know, the moment of the subject, uh, which, and, and, you know, which can, you know, change anything and offer a, br like a form of break 
within that structural eminence, eminence which is its own kind of truth. Um, also, I mean, another comment on that, that which I didn't really get a chance to speak about, is we've, through collaboration with the performers, we, we do a thing where the scores are all very complexly notated, but there's, this is divested at the moment of interpretation. So there, there's a mix of, like, very co highly complex and, and you know impossible notation but that this can be transformed in any way almost like a real book and you what you would think that, that becomes it usually it's the more difficult complex stuff that remains and actually it's other aspects of the work where that subjective momentary intervention happens so yeah there is absolutely these non-human structures but that combines always with this contingency that is the practice of art and i think that's really important to maintain kind of a key word to contemporary world, to our existing in this contemporary world, and as well as the process of creativity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Milos, don't you have some comments or questions <laughs> to this insightful presentation, so rich? Yes, please, and turn on your microphone, please. Can I, can I say to Milos very quickly, now I've drank my water, I wanted to ask a question earlier, but it was so... Um, the, uh, I agree entirely with you about the, um, the coming, uh, uh, what would you call it, cyborg, where we're all going to be connected up together in some way. And I suppose that's kind of a lot of the point of maybe what I'm talking about is that we're already, we should, we're already doing it, but through more ancient technologies. And just to, uh, to speak more about that, but sorry. I should, I should have asked it during your presentation, but like I say, I was, um, yeah, my... Uh, okay, I'm uh, unmuted now. Uh, well... I must say, uh, as a veteran of dozens of, of conferences, I, I don't remember hearing a paper so densely packed with ideas. So it would really need uh, quite a while to, to read it through and to, to somehow um, ruminate on some of these ideas. So perhaps again, my comments or questions be, would be rather superficial and not, not really to the point. Uh, of course, uh, since I've quoted Deleuze and, and devoted part of my prayer to that, uh, probably uh, the most logical comment would be, do we really need this labor of, of the negative, this, this dialectic bit? But I'm, I'm not uh, really uh, uh, willing to enter into this sort of discussion. Instead, I'm just thinking, when it comes to the creative process, you're writing your piece. Now, uh, talking about the quantum mechanics, which of course, for all we know, functions at the micro level. Uh, how do you make this, this transition between this um, sub, level of, of uh, ruled by the quantum mechanics and the world which you are creating in your composition, which inevitably succumbs to the laws which are more or less Newtonian, at least as far as, as we can perceive it as uh, Newtonian is really the best approximation that we can that we can perceive. So so how 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 do you straddle that gap between? The Thank you. Thank you so much, Milos. It's a wonderful question. And yeah, just to, I mean, I, um, I should be quite, I should be clear. The nature of the external world, I don't, I don't think, particularly at the moment, isn't so important to us. The main, the the main, the most important part of that cut to the coming cultural dominant, I think, is the fact that it's different. The fact that it is that, well, I'll, re I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase the argument. The idea is that when the quantum computer comes about, that we won't be able to, we won't be able to shrug off this discrepancy between consensus and external reality. No matter what that is, the sense perceptions are that we most of us and you know most political and aesthetic discourse subscribes to is this idea of you know that you move through a three-dimensional space that your senses can tell you certain things 
Uh, and actually, just to, you know, I was thinking about this in terms of your, your talk um, and what you were describing, and I was thinking particularly in the UK at the moment, and I don't know, in, o in other places also, there's been kind of a, I don't, know, I don't know if you would call it a regression, but a regression away from kind of the post-structural developments back towards, much more towards the individual and the idea of the artist as somebody who could, like this, this very, you know, 19th century, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, view of art that you somehow have something to express that you can take that in some way and communicate that to another subject it's very outdated and i don't know if that's maybe just because of the uk because you know we're going backwards in lots of other ways politically etc but you know it, it, maybe it's it's happening it, it's it's definitely happening i think in 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 lots of places and we know my hope or my wager is that the second quantum revolution as the material basis for a kind of new cultural dominant whatever that will be the one thing that we can predict about it is that it won't make that possible so in the way that you know the technological basis of the information age has changed how we how we think about ourselves in fact it's reprogrammed us you know even what we're doing now is quite a good is quite a good example of of making new possibilities but also under, i think understanding ourselves in a different way um of what 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 we are and what art could be and the hope is that, that so you can't predict anything more about it than that apart from that that discrepancy that consensus that consensus reality is not external reality will be made more manifest so when the quantum computer becomes a part of everyday life in a much more when it's predicting the weather when it's you know when it's uh, when it's when it's redefining our financial systems we won't be able to ignore the transcendence that is implicated within its within that technological material basis and that that will mean and so that is basically the only idea the nature of quantum mechanics or none of that is is implicated in the work it's simply this idea of the, of the discrepancy of the discrepancy between the two and what that means for the individual so one of those things is this idea of multiple meanings engaged within the work um, so m multiple readings that can be content that, that are mutually exclusive that can still be contained in the work um, and I suppose I as an example of that just with with robe for instance it implies two completely um, well, I guess the best, the, best, the best example might be to give two reviews, actually. There was two, and two very bad reviews, I should say, not, not good ones, but two, two pannings um, from uh, one from Fanfare and one from a, a blog online. But they're both really, the point is they're both very good music critics. They know what they're talking about and gave two completely different um, assertions of what the work was. Um, so to one, it was a repetitive atonal role, which to an extent, in, there, is a, there is a perhaps a way that you can argue it. And the other one, it was uh, a complete, you know, postmodern uh, pluralist with no center whatsoever. Now, both those things can't be correct. And both, the, but both those, you know, both those people know what they're talking about. And that is the idea of what, what this technique tries to do, of build this plurality of perspective within an imminent structure so that it is both and neither at the same time. Does that, uh, sorry, I've, sorry, have I been talking for a long time? I apologize. It seems that we have to stop. I mean, yes, <laughs> so, I'm so sorry. It's um, so, so bad that Milos really, cannot really join thank us you, because thank you for the question, great, Milos. but we will continue that yeah, discussion. Of course, of course, Catherine. I apologize, thank you. No, no, no problem, Alastair, um, thank you very much. Just, but of course, yeah, we and thank you everyone, somehow thank you. have to meet this time schedule, but Indeed, thank you so much for your inspiring presentation.
Tutto lì adesso non adesso ci ah, ah, fa vivo. So, hello everyone. Um, it is an honor for me to attend this conference and also a, little, a, a bit scared to speak about creative process for the composers because I'm not. <laughs> Yes, and today my topic is the composing process as a strategic combination model from theory to practice. Uh, 1713, in the book This New Opnete Orchestra, Johann Matheson presented the first structural model of music composition. 1787, Heinrich Christoph Koch, Matheson's theory based on the laws of rhetoric, brought closer to music and developed teaching about the aspects of the work, states, and the process of composition. However, only in the 20th century, the creative process did attract psychologists, researchers of human behavior attention. Only then, fundamental complementary theories were introduced. And here is some notable authors. Um, most theories are based on general creative thinking and the underlying psychology philosophy knowledge, since the expression of creative thought directly depends on the creator's individuality. Not all declarable models of creativity can be applied in their original form, primarily based on the logic of the creative process stages investigated by different theory. Nevertheless, more detailed studies of theories allows us uh, to observe the common denominators and supplements, the combinations to identify the uh, horizontal of the work composition process directly related to the analysis of the selected composer, composer's work. In the composing process analysis, the main object becomes the pre-compositional material. The unlimited expressions can be named composers' written drafts. The abundance and detail of pre-compositional material in the research of creative processivity directly correlate with the result, how deeply we can look at the composer's thoughts and restore the processivity and genesis of creation. Such studies uh, reveal the creative levels of individual work and create the formation retrospective of the work and evolution of creative thought. However, no unified method enables studying different pre-compositional material because each composer's creative process, writing and sketching of ideas is very individual. A specific creative process model can be applied as a template for only crustomity specimens. The obstacle is the specificity of the field. Most creative thinking models were based on general creative thinking knowledge. That is why, in our case, music creation no longer falls within the framework of known models. Therefore, the analysis of precompositional material in this context becomes conditional. Dave Hadlam, uh, who explores composer sketches, summarized the positions of using sketches in the analysis, the ability to relate and identify the chronology of the finished work, to reveal the composer's original impulse, compositional methods and processes. Uh, therefore, um, excuse me, 10 years before Ian Ben concluded that it was the desire to reconstruct the biography of the composition its path of the origin that became the main impetus for musicologists' interest in sketch studies, how to investigate fundamentally the extent to which the early unproceeded pre-compositional material is related to the final finished work and in what chronological order the whole composition was created. However, to look at the chronology of the work and identify its individual stages, the detail of the precompositional material becomes a prerequisite. A handbook to 20th century musical sketches by Friedman Salas and Patricia Hall analyzes sketches from Mozart to Luciano Berio and explores the specifications and features of precompositional material. However, only a tiny part allows a more profound look beyond technological work access and the compositional process itself. The most precise disting uh, distinction between different phases of creation can be seen in the precompositional material uh, of authors declaring the rational beginning of creation. Uh, although 
the moment uh, of finding a systematically composing an idea is marked by fundamental research by Barry Cooper, William Kinderman, Martin Knust and other authors. This boundary is mostly really revealed in Arnold Schomburg creativity research. The fixation of essential series and its functional varieties in the ex execution of work marks an important breakthrough in the creative process. For this reason, in the 20th century, uh, uh, the works of composers who radically change uh, their approach to creativity and music writing make uh, it the most flexible approach to the study of the composing process and its phases. The table below systemizes the most influential method models of creative thinking that exist today. It is not worth it that uh, there are significantly, uh, significantly more of them. However, mostly are only replicas and supplements of Graham Wallace model presented in the field of creativity adapted in different spheres. The report scope does not allow us to elaborate on each uh, of these theories, but we can visually see the phases of each model and their basic definition. Definitions. Yes. Uh, in addition, an overview of different models of the creative process allows uh, to state the existence of stable, constant phases and, the, and their possible additions, variables. As we can see, Wallace divides the creative process into four stages, preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. These phases are found in all models below, so they become the supporting macrophases in the table. Despite the different definitions, their function remains the same and their content variations differ slightly. Thus, it makes it possible to distinguish common denominators in all models to divide the creative phases according to the, their typology and significations. We can see it in different colors highlighted in the table. Despite the similarities, we can also see some differences that emerge in some authors' more detailed segmentation of the creative process. For example, Fritz, uh, 1991, distinguishes the phases of action, creation, and acceleration with, by their content, are defined in Wallace model as one, the ver verifica verification phase. How, uh, however, the possibility to com of combining different models by analyzing the precompositional material allows for more pl pl uh, flexible form of a unique and adaptive model of the creative process of an individual composer. The principle of morphological box developed in 1942 by American physicist Fritz Frisky includes a systematic and complete uh, analysis of all possible modifications of a fact or object. In this study, the morphological principle allows uh, the synthesis of different models. Moreover, it creates an appropriate base of variables which can be applied in the analysis of precompositional material according to the model's closest, closest macro and micro-specific equivalents. It is important to know that the macro part of the creative process does not necessarily have to be larger in terms of material content. Macro and micro concepts denote the significance and stability of the creative stage in the horizontal of the whole creative process. The table presents the conceptual models of the creative uh, process formed by different authors, also creates 72 two hypothetical phases of or creativity stages. Depending on their content and the character characteristics of precompositional material analyzed, the number uh, and sequence of composition phases become unlimited using the principle of combining these models. Perhaps the essential issues for scholars studying the creative process is how much previous experience contributes to creativity, understanding of creation, and self-realization in composing music. Furthermore, as a multimodal or transformational process of, of perception, preparation if involves cognition, music, and its domains accurate over a long period. 
Thus, among other things, uh, the definition of creativity and the prob problem of identifying creative thinking becomes inevitable for fundamental research of the creative process. Still, it is a topic that requires independent research. Meanwhile, the study of the processivity of music creation highlights the specifics of the composer's work behind the scenes. Zvonomir Negi, 2017, emphasizes interdisciplinarity in research of the composing process. According to the author, the links between psychology and neuroscience play a key role in researching creative processivity and analyzing the composing practices of indi individual. Uh, Negi defines the embodiment of music, uh, musical thought as cognitive and performative causality, arguing for the elements of creative associations found in the person and works of each creator. The role of memory in the creative process involves another important construct, as it is known that creative thinking is based on memory, which must transcend memories to, creative, to create something new. In Aegis' view, creative thought is perceived as prolific recombination of distant associative elements influenced by the principle of causality. Whatever point of view we try to examine the process of composing, we will inevitably encounter the concept of time. That serves in this study with its objective form, eliminating phenomenological definition. The combination of different models, as mentioned, uh, creates an extensive possibility of varieties. The attempt to systemize the definitions of the creative process stages according to, the, to their significations and the perception of their process as a dynamic action occurring at a certain time distance and conditioned by causal re relations led me the idea to illustrate the morphological box as a clock mechanism. It is interesting that uh, this mechanism is quite similar to Wallace's creative process model, which uh, works also um, on the principle of four main phases. It should be noted that this model I am using is only a way to provide the more explicit material of different theories and a tool of their typology. As mentioned, the combination of different theoretical models creates a large base of microprocesses and selection of which directly depends on the content of the analyzed work. Thus, macrophase or process that acts at the main gears uh, of the creative process in this study is depicted clearly as stars or wheels with shafts. Each one is implicated as a um, separate microphase. Such an interface in illustrates the significance and importance of uh, causality in the creative process. Creativity, process, phases, time. Quite a lot of operational and problematic concepts. So let me try to combine them into one chain. How can all these theoretical constructs can be adapted in practical work by analyzing the process of composing music. The case of Lithuanian composer Julius Zelunas is especially grateful for the research of creative process. On the one hand, he conceptualized his creative met method in habilitation work on the structure of the chord, 1972. On the other hand, the rich archive of manuscripts, sketches, and other material related to the creative work allows tracing the final versions. So let's take a look brief at one of his creative examples, string quartet number three, nine letters and post scriptum, 1969. In the beginning, uh, we can see two important references. The form description, a title that integrates the content of the work form and a clear three-part note, each integrating three sub-segments, an harmonic plan that becomes the main operative connecting material. At the first look, short marks in the theory of creative process stages immediately answers the most important question, the moment of the idea. Using the definitions of the models we know, it can be seen that in the creative process of this work, the idea and the conception 
the reference of which is clearly marked even before the music writing begins, becomes the first stage. Before, there was probably a particular moment of preparation, although we cannot rule out the possibility of a sudden creative breakthrough, or as Honor Yarmolovich would observed in her research, pre-composition in thought. However, the main building preparatory material of this work, harmonic cells, is marked later. The, thus, uh, it concludes that the preparation phase followed the uh, idea birth, or in Wallace terms, after illumination. The additional content of the sketch is consistent writing of the entire of the entire composition with detailed, uh, with detailed uh, timestamps and corrections that can be seen in the diagram on the slides. Here, yes. From the analytical aspect of processivity, we can name it as the verification phase during which the composer implements, writes down the purified material, evaluates and corrects it. Looking deeper, we can also see the smaller micro phases or processes, which depending on their definition are close to the mark recorded in the pre-compositional material. For example, in the repetition phase by Kratos. Yes. Uh, the sketch shows that Yuzelunas wrote the last part twice. Yes. Uh, although international content uh, remained the same, he wrote this, this, passage, um, this passage using different rhythmic values and uh, means of expression. Looking at the sketch from a distance, uh, the following scheme of the creative process emerge, emerge uh, preparation with microprocesses, preparation in thoughts and ante uh, anticipation of concept uh, and ma musical material, uh, illumination verifi and verification with repetition micro phase. Yes. Creative process um, is a study with limited possibilities of conceptual conclusions requiring the maximum contact of the object, detailed pre-compositional material. Existing creative process models can serve as a statistical option but not a condition in their content and thesis because the content of the pre-compositional material is different in all cases. The analysis based on the original model uh, proposed by the author becomes non-functional. However, from a musicological perspective, it is possible to find the basic schemes of the creative process and identify its different phases and microprocesses operating in them. Of course, such studies cannot be absolute or accepted as non-negotiable constant. However, the combination of different models makes it possible to apply a differential model for each composer or even a piece. Uh, with the right object, certain creative tendencies can be uh, observed, the repetitions of which presuppose a more comprehensive discussion and research aimed at uh, conceptualizing the idea of modeling creative pro process, its stages, characteristics, significations, and their integration in the analytical research of musical composing process. So thank you for your attention and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Yurgita, for your elegantly prepared schemes and, and presentation. So since time is going and soon the next session will start and we need some time to rest, so it's, it's time to, to, to make one question maybe. Is it anyone from public who wants to ask some questions? If not, so, okay. <laughs> Let's go and have Thank a coffee you. break, it's time. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Ce o galim adevăr, eu? Negerai, negaliu parodyti, nes nėra pradikų. Siaugas. O žiūrėkite, dabar žiūrėkite, reiškia, paprasta, jeigu aš perkeliu iš čia, iš čia, nutempiu, ką, iš karto bus, ar ne? Nu, tai gal tai. Nu, va, ne, aš esu. Yra. Ir tą bandysiu nuo čia daryti. Kai susidaryti, aš pas tą dar žinodyta kažkas kaip, tai aš per zoom'ą pasidalinti ekraną reikės. Dabar, kaip per zoom'ą, jo? Nu, aš turiu kompaktiniam variante. Nu, reiškia, du kompaktai pas mane yra. Ir garsas tam tik tai. Arba perrašyti kažkokį būdų, bet aš nežinau, aišku, čia jau užtruktų. Dabar žiūrėk, tu persirašai čia į tą desktopą, ar ne, reiškia į tą staliuką ir paskiau iš jo dabar duodė, ne, vat kaip šitas bus, ar ne. Septintas, ar ne? Nežinau, aš vačiau, pas pauzę dar šitą yra prezentacija. Šitas, jo? Jo. Na, ir šiuo. Na, va, tada kitą kartą. Gerai. Galbūt ir kitas yra, kur iš šiek septynių mūsų, bet šiek septynių yra ir tu. Tas yra penki. Penki, 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 penki gal. Iš penki. Jo, pabandžiu. Jo, nu, daina. Tas 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 Gerai, kad dabar kiti pavyzdžių negaliu parodyti. Tai gal ką nors sugalvosim kažkaip tai. Nes kai bet tai rodo, aš tik gerai. Čia viskas tu aišku. Nu, žiūrėk, aš tu prasiu, ką aš kas šiandien. Nu, bet tu paskiau. Nu ir aš dabar toks čia sėdėsiu plėtų pavyzdžių. Va, ir man... Ir paskiau čia, ir paskiau va čia, va. Va čia. Nu ir čia. Gerai. O, tai šauna bus. Gerai, esam prasit. Aš tu apie tai porą pavyzdėlį, vieną norint tam suliaudęs muziką, kadangi vis tiek kalbam apie tas harmonizacijos.
Και εσύ πολλέ. Nu, man nesunti grįžti kaip po Ostrausko.
چه بسیونی Ne? E, kada pradete? Gerai. Pusę, ne, baigis. Tai tu man nesink duosti žinėt gal gerai, jau kai tas dešimt minučių jie gulėt, apie maždaug, arba penkias minučias. Dabar, o kaip čia du kartą aš matau? A, gerai, gerai, gerai. Pasidalinti ekraną, nes ir čia ir zūna matysiu. Gerai, gerai. Tvarkoj, tvarkoj. Aš nežinau, turbūt čia kas...
Ерекше. Жюрек. Ар турет чоу кайп эртэнки палайсам бардар кыртыстый. Кайп сакас? Кайп палайс ман дабар кыртыстый магитар. Гал аш праджи висы шера жоджи и жангей. Ай, герой, ты рекай шер скрин ир... О, юс гарсы иргей че лайсы. Ты гал тада аш прия... Йо, кока у... So welcome back. <clears throat> we start the second session today. The moderator had to be Antana Skuczynskas, who unfortunately cannot be here due to some health problems. So I will be here instead of him. And uh, the second session will be about ethnic and national patterns in, uh, as creative stimulus. Um, to presentations will be given about uh, our famous composer and uh, painter Cirlonis. And a slight change in the program. <clears throat> the last two presentations will switch the orders. So Judita Zhukeni and Gabriel Lucima Sapiega, the last presentation will be the third one. And Aretol will be the last one. So just, just to know, a little change. And now I invite uh, Darius Kuczynskas from Kaunas University of Technology, Lithuania. Welcome to present a paper which is titled Phenomena of Chirlons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, hello once more to everybody. I am very pleased with the invitation to participate in your conference. And it's really a great pleasure to join you uh, physically, not only online. And uh, my topic is phenomenon of Cirlonis. To speak about Cirlonis is easy and difficult. It's easy because in Lithuania we know Cirlonis maybe from the school years. And it's difficult because Cirlonis is really a very complex uh, uh, personality and a very multidimensional artist. Artists, so his uh, art is, uh, uh, in, uh, corresponds between music, art, writing, photography and other activities. Uh, well, uh, Cirlonis came to my life really from the years of studies. I moved to once to Cirlonis National Museum to check one manuscript and stayed there for 10 years because I was invited to uh, do some research on his musical archive. It was a great uh, possibility and chance to uh, know his music heritage uh, very in, in very details. Well, and in my presentation, I tried to show maybe some discoveries I made. I try to uh, show and to speak about other discoveries made by other scholars and researchers. Uh, well, uh, and the main thing maybe is really to keep the tradition, to keep the canon of research of Cirlonis, because uh, uh, as I told, in Lithuania we know maybe everything, but on the other side we don't know nothing because Cirlonis is like a mystery, like a very interesting uh, personality. Uh, some questions are uh, not answered up till today. Uh, he was really very interesting uh, personality in the time when he lived. 
uh, but he was not known for the Europe and for the rest of the world because he uh, lived and created uh, not in the main cultural centers of Europe. He was living in small town in his best place and he was quite a closed personality and uh, not uh, many compositions of his, uh, not many compositions were published, were spread in the world uh, even if he spoke, uh, if he speak about music. So mm, music compositions really uh, were published about few decades, decades after his death. Uh, and uh, if we speaking about uh, his paintings, this pa his paintings were presented in the Petersburg, in uh, Moscow, in Kiev, in Vilnius after his death. So mm, uh, many things uh, came uh, too late. If we uh, uh, remember his uh, life, he lived only 36 years. And as you see, it was uh, a short time. He was born in 1875, died in 1911. And uh, I tried to, uh, him, to draw the, uh, more visually how he was involved in music and in painting. In music, he was involved about uh, really well, 20 years, but uh, as a composer, he is, was uh, active about 10 years, and as a painter, he was active only seven years. As we see, he was, uh, uh, he learned music in Plunge, in Warsaw, in Leipzig, and then he worked in uh, Vilnius, in uh, Petersburg. And uh, maybe for us, it's uh, interesting uh, the criteria or uh, factors uh, which influenced uh, his personality. Uh, we should start maybe from the natural features, then we can speak about family, about surrounding nature, geographical place, European centers, and contemporaries or people he communicated with. Uh, natural features, it, uh, I think it is very important to note that uh, he, he was a very sensitive personality. He was a uh, very emotional uh, personality. He has, of course, absolute uh, pitch. He has a feeling of synesthesia. He uh, saw colors when he listened music and in vice versa. He uh, uh, saw uh, and he uh, listened music when he was uh, looking at the paintings. And of course, curiosity, he was very interested in uh, not only music or painting, he was interested in astronomy, in uh, archaeology, in uh, history, in other things. Uh, and uh, uh, the main ideas he really produced late in his uh, creative uh, activity, it came really from this uh, surrounding uh, culture and surrounding uh, things he was interested, he was uh, reading, he was uh, looking for. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, book he wrote, he uh, read, it was uh, the uh, book about astronomy, Astronomy Popular, written by Camille Flammarion, one of the famous uh, astro astronomers, uh, where was described uh, about uh, not only the our own world, but about many worlds in the space. And it was fascinating uh, for Chilonis because he was, he started to think about different worlds, not only our world, the earth, but other worlds, and it is about possibility to create and to live in other worlds. Well, the family was very large and Chilonis was the oldest person in the family of 11 people, 11 ch childs. His father was a church organist, uh, and uh, of course he influenced the oldest son, Mikolaos Konstantinos, because Mikolaos uh, learned to play the uh, organ and uh, played uh, in the church uh, really from the, his uh, childhood, about four or five years he already played uh, from memory. And being the oldest uh, son in the family, he was uh, uh, I'd say he teached uh, uh, younger sisters and brothers uh, his uh, m music, he teached uh, many things, and uh, the youngest, uh, younger uh, brothers and sisters, for example, Jadwiga, Valeria, and Jonas, and uh, Stasis, and Povelos, and all of them also studied music, st starting from uh, teaching by children, and later they all moved to uh, Warsaw. 
Uh, well, the place where Chelonis lived was very uh, also interesting in that time. It was uh, a small uh, city, Druskininke, which was on the corner of three provinces. It means uh, after um, many political changes and historical events, uh, Druskininke appeared on the corner between uh, provinces of Vilnius, province of Gardnes, and province of Valky. It means between different, uh, um, even... Uh, countries between Poland, Kingdom and Russia and uh, there were places where two calendars were used, Julian and Gregorian. Uh, it was also different uh, languages spoken, Polish, Russian, Lithuanian. So Chirilonis from the uh, first years was in a multicultural and multilingual uh, uh, context and it uh, influenced very much his later creative uh, activity. Uh, Druskinke was a, a resort from uh, 1794. It was a famous resort with mineral waters, and many people came here from Petersburg, from Warsaw, from Moscow, even from other country, uh, cities, and uh, cultural life in summers uh, also influenced Chirilonis as a young person. Uh, when he was teenage, he was sent to study music and to play in orchestra, in wind orchestra in Plunge, where was uh, uh, a new uh, building uh, built like a manor by Count Oginsky, Mikolas Oginskis, who was a grandson of the famous composer Mikolas Oginskis, and me, we remember the famous uh, Polonaise uh, uh, farewell to the homeland. Uh, so Chirilonis uh, was in a surrounding of very active cultural life where he played flute. He learned to play flute. He was uh, uh, in a staff of orchestra. Uh, and this orchestra participated in many events in the uh, uh, manner and also around the reg region, even moved to Baltic Sea, to other uh, small cities and larger cities. And uh, the um, Count Oginskis really became the first uh, manager and face, uh, first sponsor of Chilonis because he suggested him to move to Warsaw to study music and also he sponsored him. Well, Chilonis uh, was uh, influenced, of course, by few big cities where he studied. It, it was Warsaw, it was Leipzig and Petersburg. In Warsaw, he studied uh, in Warsaw Music Institute, officially titled, but it was really like a conservatoire. He studied under uh, Noskovsky, the famous composer and teacher, who formed really the National School of Polish Composers. Uh, after then, uh, he moved to Leipzig, where he uh, studied under Jadason and Reinecke. He studied only for one year, a very short time, because uh, the uh, Count uh, Oginski died suddenly and he lost uh, money for studies. So, uh, so af only after one year, uh, Chirilonis returned back to the birthplace, Druskininke, and only after a few years he moved to Petersburg as a already uh, composer and painter. But in Warsaw, he returned uh, in 1904 to the Warsaw where the Art Academy was opened and he uh, changed his activity to the art, to art. Uh, and it's uh, the Warsaw really made influence twice as a, com to, as a composer and as a painter. Uh, the other city is very important for Chirlonis where he already returned as after his old studies. It was Vilnius. Uh, the Vilnius uh, in future, after decade, it was uh, capital of uh, in Lithuania, but in that time, in year uh, 1905-1906, it was only a small province of the uh, Russian Empire, where only few few music activity, very uh, few music ensembles and uh, musicians lived. So Chirilonis felt a little dis uh, disappointed here. So he was involved in Lithuanian activity, uh, uprising of Lithuanian uh, um, cultural life. It was, uh, he was involved in conducting national choir. He started to arrange uh, folk songs. But really, Vilnius, comparing with uh, Warsaw or Leipzig, he on that time didn't have uh, philharmonic, didn't have orchestra. So it was a very uh, 
local and provincial town for that time. So Chelyonis decided to move to Petersburg. But uh, Vilnius was very important because he met uh, uh, Sofia, his wife, and uh, Sofia influenced uh, him very much uh, uh, to become a Lithuanian composer. Uh, Chelyonis, even before, before uh, met uh, Sofia, he decided to devote, to devote all his music and paintings to Lithuania, to the country which not uh, existed on that time on the political map. And it was very interesting because he believed in the future of Lithuania and really after his death, after 10 years uh, uh, of his declaration, Lithuania uh, declared independence and all his paintings really were collected and preserved in Lithuania as a national heritage. Really, Chilonis is a, like a cornerstone of modern Lithuanian art, so his creative uh, music, art uh, became uh, very important for the country. Well, uh, if we speak about contemporaries and the frame line, um, uh, frames of his life, we can uh, see that he lived in the same time as Arnold Schomberg, Kandinsky, Strauss, Mahler. Of course, uh, two uh, Richards, two Richards made a biggest influence to children. It was Richard Strauss and uh, Richard uh, Wagner, but of course, Gustav Mahler not all of music uh, he could listen of them because uh, only a few comp uh, concerts of Richard Strauss were organized in Warsaw when he was uh, studying. Uh, and uh, mm, Chirlonis didn't meet them personally. And they, uh, Kandinsky, Strauss, Mahler or Schoenberg didn't know anything about uh, Chirlonis, but it was in direct links and I will say later, it was uh, uh, one person who invited Chirlonis to the modern exhibition of modern art. Uh, and it was uh, some links uh, uh, in this, uh, in this movements. Well, we see that it was uh, really the time when symbolism, uh, ex impressionism, expressionism, abstract and eternal art started on that years and Chirlonis really also worked and was active as a separate and individual person. But uh, uh, we also should mention another person, it's very interesting, uh, Chirlonis met, for example, Julian Carillo, a Mexican composer who invented a microtonal system. Uh, he also studied in Leipzig together with Chirlonis and uh, they uh, listen each other of uh, music. Uh, Chirlonis admired of Carillo, but Carillo, after Leipzig, he moved to Paris and he uh, returned back to Mexico. He was a very famous Mexican composer. He even established a society of El Sonido 13 or uh, 13th Sound, where he um, developed his ideas on, on microtonality. Uh, and uh, the first uh, symphonies of symphonic music of Chirlonis also were, was a little influenced by Carillo. Uh, other uh, artist is uh, Schul Solar, Argentinian artist, uh, little known in Europe, uh, also because maybe he was not uh, published, was not presented in the lifetime, but he invented very interesting uh, piano, as we see, the color keyboard with touching, uh, with possibility uh, and feeling of touching. And he was thinking also about universal things where we can combine all our sens sensorities, uh, feeling, uh, test, uh, uh, touching, uh, listening, uh, seeing and other things in one universal uh, expression tool. Even he composed a pan chess game where everything all out, so all uh, the world should be involved in this pan game uh, where the creativity and uh, expressions could be universal for persons. In Sweden, we can mention Hugo Alfven, who also was a painter and composer, who also was a Sweden uh, national composer, who formed the national uh, music of Sweden. Uh, but more interesting is another Sweden artist, Viking Egeling, who tried to uh, implement musical forms, musical structures in the moving. And he is one of the first abstract uh, filmmakers. He composed or created a Diagonal Symphony in 1921. It was presented in Berlin. 
uh, but uh, for many decades also was forgotten, maybe of the very sudden death. Uh, but his experiments in the moving and implementation of sonata form, it's very important in the historical, in the history of development of art. Well, what we can say that Cerlonis really was uh, like a child of the time, uh, and of course he was not uh, the uh, copyist of the time. He was going on this his own way, but of course influence of the time is obvious. For example, even comparing uh, other artists, uh, maybe not known, well known for the large audience, for, for example, Bohemil Kubista, Czech uh, artist, or uh, Mariana Verovkina, uh, uh, expressionist artist. Uh, by the way, Mariana is linked with Lithuania. Uh, uh, her brother was a governor of Kaunas city. And uh, when uh, Cerlonis uh, did an exhibition of his paintings in Kaunas in the context of Lithuanian artists' exhibition, uh, the brother written email to Mariana and said that, okay, you should be interested in one person, Cerlonis. Maybe you would like to invite him to the more modern exhibitions. And Mariana, it is uh, the person who really told about Cerlonis for the Kandinsky. It is. Uh, uh, stories which are not really confirmed by documents, but it is believed because uh, nobody else knew Cherlonis in the cycle of Kandinsky. And uh, Cherlonis received an invitation to participate in the second art exhibition of Der Blau writer, but of the sudden death, he didn't take part there. Anyway, we know Arnold Schomberg, who also tried to paint in the, in the style of expressionism. And when we compare, well, we see the children, some sketches in the expressionistic mood. Uh, when we compare Cerlonis and Schoenberg, we can see sometimes uh, very interesting links that uh, also, and Arnold Schoenberg and Nicolas Cerlonis tried to express not only real things, but also thoughts, mind, and maybe invisible substances. For example, speech or looking, uh, the things which are not material things. Uh, if we compare Cerlonis art with uh, Kandinsky, we also can see that Cerlonis was going to abstract art. He tried to paint not real things, not representational things, but he tried to find the way how to abstract uh, reality how to express in abstract way. And here we see that maybe a few years earlier, like Kandinsky, he really was going to the abstract art. It was a very intensive and very interesting discussion in 1950s after Second World War between uh, Estonian uh, art critic, uh, historian, art historian Alex Ranit and the wife of Kandinsky. And it was a discussion who was the first abstract painter. Because we know that the first abstract paint, uh, painting of Kandinsky was dated 1910. And Alex Ranit said that, okay, but uh, Cirillonis did first abstract paintings in 1907, 1908. And he was based on this painting and on other painting, for example, this painting, where we see really quite abstract forms, uh, not referential things. Uh, but uh, maybe things uh, where that uh, Cirlone is not uh, summarized theoretically what he done. And maybe it was the reasons why we cannot speak about Cirlone's abstract art. But links it was here. And uh, arguments of uh, wife of Marie, of, uh, of Kandinsky was that it, uh, it was not based on Cirlone's paintings because after Cerlone's death, uh, after F First World War, Lithuania was quite a closed country and uh, many of Cerlone's paintings were in, presented only in Kaunas. Nobody saw them and especially after Second World War, nobody knew about Cerlone's. Well, if we speak about creative heritage of Cerlone's, we can calculate up to 500 music compositions, including arrangements and transcriptions and versions, up to 300 paintings and graphic uh, uh, paintings, uh, several poems, literal texts, and few uh, articles uh, in periodical. 
Uh, if we see in a uh, uh, line, we can see that uh, Chelonis, first of all, was a composer, musician. Then he was like, uh, active like an artist, painter. And then we see like a synthesis and uh, efforts to synthesize art and music. We even can uh, title uh, these uh, different fields like thesis, antithesis, and really synthesis. Because the main ideas of Cherlonis was really to find a way how to synthesize all of arts, all of expression fields, and he used that going on the way to, in, to create or to invent the universal language, how to invent the universal language of expression, how to implement symmetry, which is quite a universal thing and uh, common for music, for art, for architecture, for other uh, artistic expression, sonata form, how to implement into art, and how to up implement abstract forms from the pictorial uh, art to into music, and uh, how to really create abstract music or atonal music, because uh, we don't need uh, dances or folk uh, music, we need to go to abstract art with, which is uh, understandable for everybody without any translations. And the features of composing process is also very interesting. He was composing in very short and very intensive like uh, gusts, very short periods. Uh, and all these gusts going into a cyclic type of thinking and cyclic type of uh, creating. He was uh, composing in short times, like in, in short cycles. Later, these cycles were included in larger cycles, and even uh, we can notice that, that all his creative heritage was thought like a one large cycle. Well, we have some links and parallels, maybe with Scriabin, with other uh, artists, but uh, the l one of the last compositions uh, for orchestra, he not finished, only sketched, it was uh, the creation of the world, uh, the sketches of, for the symphony orchestra, where he used music compositions from the first years, from the middle years, when he composed music. So it, uh, it was a questions, and even for us a question, really, so what is a last composition of Cherlonis? The finished composition or not finished, where he tried to involve everything he composed previously. Well, the, uh, looking for the, uh, for the universal language, uh, he started from the hidden script. Well, it, uh, we know that everybody liked to create some hidden scripts to communicate with our friends, with our colleagues, that nobody can understand. Cherlonis used a special uh, code or special uh, hidden script to communicate with his brothers, and he, it is all, all code described in his letters. And according to this script, I noticed that in one manuscript, now is keeping in Chicago, in Lithuanian uh, archive, on the cover, he written some strange science, and when we use a script from the letters to Brother Povelos, we can identify that it is only a, uh, like a signature, Cherlonis. In music, he used also an ABC or alphabet he created to transform, like to translate verbal language into nonverbal language. He uh, prepared like an ABC and tried to compose music. So an example is very interesting. There are three bars of atonal music, atonal composition, year 1904-1905. So what we can speak, are this, uh, is, is this example really a start of atonal music or not? Or only it's only example to translate a verbal language? The music sounds like that, like this. Very interesting. Uh, the sketch is not finished, as you see. The meter is not indicated because it is uh, uh, bars, bar lines are uh, draw according to the words. You notice the first bar is uh, for uh, quarters or eight uh, eights. Second bar is nine quarters because it is nine letters in his second word. And the last bar is of eight notes, uh, eight quarters. Very interesting solution, very interesting way. If he elaborated this way, it will be very interesting. 
Okay. Uh, well, looking to the paintings and the graphical sketches, he left his, one of our musicologists, Ripa Mbrovilionine, looked at the ornaments and tried to decipher what these ornaments are really meaning. And we see in the uh, right side, he uh, marked these ornaments like a lettuce. Here we see obvious S kite means Sophia Kimantaite, the first letters of his wife. And here is a signature of Cherlonis, Nikolaus Konstantinus Cherlonis. So Rima Pavilionina deciphered and de described that it is written. This is not an ornament, but it is a monograph and uh, of course a sentence. Zosenka Yedina, it means the Sophie, the only one. So uh, up till today, we have some examples not yet deciphered. So it's a task, task for you to decipher, not uh, written, not deciphered scripts. Of course, uh, we uh, need more maybe examples, but it's not a musical example. It's of course a verbal text. We should, um, we should also waiting for, for somebody who deciphered that. Uh, so, uh, looking for universal language, uh, Cirilloni started from very interesting things, uh, from uh, trying to understand that, uh, for example, cycle of fifths is not finished, and he tried, used uh, tonalities not practically used. You see, thesis, his, double B, Mall. It's unusable, unusable to analysis modes, but it also was an experiment in the first years of studies. But later he tried to uh, reduce double uh, bemol into special sign, which later was, according to similarity, changed to the sign of Saturn and used in his, in his code in a letter U. So he was looking for the links between Verb, verbal language, non-verbal language, and how it can communicate, correlate under the similarities and under changing the meaning. He was looking for the similarities, how to transform natural sign into the key, letter Kir, it means the first letter of his name, and even tried to do sketches uh, in the form of a letter, which is also very original uh, in the art history. Uh, well, in, even in late uh, paintings in Sonata of the Stars, we see that he tried to correlate maybe musical sign, the Basque left, into painting. In uh, music scores, we can find that he finished music, but not creative idea, and music was continued with his artistic expression in a drawings. So sometimes it's expressed in a comparison between music and painting, sometimes in looking for connections, how to translate, how to transform musical, uh, musical expression into visual art. Uh, in the sketches of symphony poem, The Sea, sometimes we see the very funny uh, pictures where he tried to imitate or to illustrate the mood of the music he composed and, and written in notes. Of course, the first picture is like an autoportrait, uh, one of the maybe more realistic and best uh, autoportraits he left after Cirillonis. Well, uh, and the correspondence of arts uh, was, of course, discovered by musicologists, by art critics, historians. Uh, Landsberg has tried to summarize uh, these correlations and he uh, noted that many often, there are many often cases when Cirillonis uh, composed music, composed melody in the line very similar in his paintings. So it was like a unification of a contour or a graphical line which corresponds to musical line or melody. Uh, it is a visual uh, correlations, but there are also sometimes colors correlate to the mood uh, structures in paintings correlate with structures in music and going on that uh, way uh, German musicologist Dorothea Eberlein also discovered that uh, there are some similarities between his music and uh, paintings of the same year. For example, the cycle of the sea painted in 1908 and the cycle of music compositions under the same title Marius or the sea 
it has similarities, structural and uh, thematical similarities. Maybe uh, more obvious similarities uh, were discovered by me in, okay, about 20 years ago already. <laughs> Uh, when I tried to compare his uh, cycle of uh, sparks, the painted cycle of sparks, with uh, the two variations, unpublished and not finished variations for the piano, uh, according to the letters, uh, uh, some of the points in the painting uh, were like a lines, I connected these lines, and the graphical line were similar to the musical line. It's interesting that um, in the same year, Cherlonis written the psalm, a poem, literal poem, where uh, few words were repeated quite often. It, pay, it was uh, interesting for me why these words were repeated, uh, in which sequence they repeated. I took them from the text, put in one line, reduced, left only first letter of the word, and it was like a musical structure. So a reduction of the psalm structure is really a musical structure. So children has tried to elaborate uh, and to implement musical form into a literal text. And it has also implementation of the symmetry. Uh, symmetry like a whole poem of psalm, also symmetry in the first part, in the middle part, so the cycles, small cycles are going into larger cycles. And maybe most interesting thing that all these uh, artworks, the verbal psalm, the musical variations and pictorial, the sparks, uh, yes, the main structure, the main idea of uh, vertical or mirror symmetry, and these all creative uh, artworks composed of created in the same um, time were used and uh, directed by the one idea to combine everything under the one unifying element. And this unifying element, of course, became the symmetry. Following these discoveries, it was uh, interesting to discover later the symmetry in the music he used, uh, for example, in the prelude of 1909, where he used uh, shifted symmetry and uh, vertical symmetry in uh, the left hand of the piano piece. Uh, we now listen this composition, maybe not all, but the first bars, and uh, when we are listening for the piano example, we listen, of course, for the melody, for the right hand, but the background is more important, and background in the left hand demonstrate us that all the music is constructed implementing symmetry structures, symmetry form. And performed is, this music is performed by German pianist Nikolaus Lausen. example is um, more maybe simple. It is from 1904 when Cherlonis also used uh, all the texture like a symmetry constructed from the symmetry from the sequences and uh, shift symmetry. Uh, another thing is augmentation and mirror reflection found in Maris set the second part. The bar 8 and bar 18 uh, is very interesting uh, where the, all the structure and texture is formed from the uh, same principle of uh, writing uh, symmetry and augmentations. 
the, for example, a second voice is going in long notes and first voice is going in short notes, but it's the same music. Uh, very interesting uh, 18 bars where we can see symmetry according uh, tenth symmetry according to uh, G sharp notes, the second voice, and the first voice is going in one direction like a scale, but it's also symmetrical. So this element's very interesting and uh, unique in Cirlione's art because he, when he started to compose, uh, uh, to paint uh, paintings, he tried to think uh, on music like an expression of visual art. Light reflection, of course, it's... Uh, mm. In uh, visual art, of course, we see also many, many examples of how Cirlione used the symmetry. And uh, sometimes we can imagine like uh, musical themes used in painting pictorial art. For example, the elements like a hand, like a head, like a finger, it's like a trees, of course, but like a also melody or elements used uh, repeated in the clouds from other side. It is like a retrograde principle of retrograde. And of course, uh, all the cycle is under the one symmetrical line, the triptych uh, day, night, evening and night is uh, the symmetrical and also the stars, sonata of the stars is symmetrical. So uh, visual structures is, uh, be became, uh, visual structures uh, became for background like for the pictorial art and also for the musical art. When we speak about uh, Cirlione's late paintings, we see that Cirlione tried to implement musical structures in his paintings. According to Russian uh, music critic and art historian Fedotov, he described, for example, this painting. Uh, oh, this is not thoughts. This should be, sorry, should be the ships. Okay, uh, the, like a three-part uh, composition where we can see like a, a first part like exposition, the motto, middle part like a polyphonic canon or strata, and augmentated part here, the third part. Uh, uh, this principle where was very similar and very common to Cirlione's musical polyphonic uh, compositions, for example, canons or fuguas, where he repeated the fugua theme uh, at the last time in augmentation. So these principles were universal for him in music and in pictorial art. Most famous uh, painting, the Fugue, uh, also composed according to Fedotov in musical structure. Here we can see exposition where used two themes and expressed in three part form. First uh, theme, first voice, second theme in second voice, third uh, voice with first theme and fourth voice with second theme. Two themes, four voices. Everything is uh, development, uh, elaborated and developed in the middle part here and in the left, uh, in the right uh, corner we see the uh, recapitulation where the second theme is dominating and from the first theme we see only very small sketches. So the uh, implementation of musical forms, polyphonic forms, uh, homophonic forms into pictorial art, and even sonata form. Sonata form was very uh, interesting for Cirlionis. He tried to implement it in pictorial art, in uh, verbal art. And in pictorial art, he cre created uh, se six, seven sonatas. He titled sonata number one, number two, number three. And why these titles are here? Because he tried to include here musical structure. For example, exposition, like a one theme, second theme, two different elements. They are repeating in a recapitulation, in augmented version. In development, we see the like a new theme, but this theme is from the first part, from exhibition, like a dominating theme. So three parts. Second or example can be sonata of the stars or sonata number six, allegro part, where we see the compos composition of pyramids, Muslim, also pyramids in a row, like a complex. This complex is repeated here. So we can see from 
top to bottom or from bottom to top. According to Fedotov, we should go from bottom to top, where this expo ex exposition, middle part with new element or like mummies here, include it and repeat it once more, three or four times repeat it, the Muslim, praying Muslim. So it's very, very uh, interesting and can be explained according to musical structure. In the verbal form, Chilonis tried to write a poem, Autumn, where Landsberg is described that this poem is like a complete sonata of four parts, Allegro, Andante, Scherzo Finale, like Chilonis used in pictorial art. But according to uh, American musicologist William White, this whole poem is only first part, like sonata Allegro, Allegro sonata. Uh, where we can see exposition, development, recapitulation with first theme, second theme, and uh, so detailed, detailed expression and detailed uh, analysis of all of each line presented by William White. It was in 1995 in a conference in Kaunas. Well, uh, serial compositions, very interesting that Chulon is used uh, to try to compose music according to letters, also reducing the names of his friends, of his colleagues, Boleslav Tcharkovsky or Stefan Jeleskevich, and he used uh, letters which, are, which have correspondence and uh, links with music. He composed uh, music, variations, for example, according to the letters. And uh, these variations, of course, left in sketches, not finished, but it's interesting that the construction on for, of variations are based on their own on the repeating crow. For, we can listen, for example, how sounds the variation Safar assets, also played by Nikolaus Lahusen. so on and so 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 it was presentation of theme but also like a first variation um, more interesting things are in the variations besatsas where he used the row of seven and each time he repeated the row from the next note from the next note and all the sketch is finished after the final team final seventh time was repeated uh, the theme from this last note uh, well uh, cannot listen because already time, but uh, anyway, it is a very interesting uh, variation, number four, where we can also reconstruct it like in a structure of palindrome, like in a square. And here we see that Chironis was going to uh, discover to how to implement abstract prime forms into music. Prime forms, I mean triangle, uh, circle or sphere, cube or square. So, for example, in the prelude of 1904-08, oh, we see the triangle. In the prelude 1906, we see the circle. Baseline is going chromatically, all the scale. And maybe more interesting thing is uh, more complex structures in prelude of 1904. Maybe a short example. In the right hand, this rhythmic pattern forms very interesting structure. bars are very interesting because it's really like a complex structures. Sometimes these structures appeared uh, intuitively uh, according to orchestration of the score. It's, uh, um, my opinion is this is not an option, conscious but unconscious result of composing process while well, he was introducing new instruments and it happened like a tree. And uh, the last painting uh, of Cellonis in 1910 
1910, the ships really suggest us to think about Chirilonius. He was dreaming about maybe three dimensional paintings, three dimensional uh, result of his creative art because he really he tried to implement prime forms and, and uh, not only two dimensions but three dimensions. And finally we can see that Chirlonis tried to use color where it sound like one universal expression tool to find uh, connections and links between inside and with outside world and with links maybe with the cinema, with the dance, with choreography. And uh, so this is maybe a few features of Chirlonis I tried to present you. Thank you very much. If you have questions, please. Yes, th th thank you for such a broad uh, mm -hmm. analysis and uh, representation of Chirlonis phenomena. Uh, and some questions maybe. I know there are people who also research Chilonis music here in the audience as well. Uh, questions, comments? Okay. Yeah, yeah yes, please. Only. Yeah, uh, there is no uh, strict rules how we should see paintings of Chirilonis, of course. And uh, some, uh, some of the critics say that we should uh, follow paintings from left to right, others uh, should suggest to follow paintings from bottom to top and so on. But really, uh, we recognize the painting as one in a moment. And only, only maybe going in detail, yes, we should follow some you know, art historians or critics who, who suggest uh, because when we're discovering details, we recognize the way how we should go on the painting. And according to Fedotov, we should, should identify the element which is like an exposition, and then we should go and follow how it is changed, transformed, and maybe part from part, like in a comics, in the complex of comics, we should also follow an idea. And, uh, well, it is not a strict rule, but uh, I... I, I follow some of uh, critics and uh, I agree with them, of them discoveries that sometimes there are pictures we should follow from top, sometimes we should follow from left side or so on, yeah, if I answered. Okay. okay, thank you. More questions, comments? Um, no. Yeah, so then thank, thank, you. You. thank you. And we will continue the topic of Chirlonis art with the next speaker. I invite Rimonta Sastrauskas from Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theater, and he will present his paper, Several Strokes for the Portrait of Chirlonis Creativity. Welcome.
Hello, excuse me for some pause in preparation, but I hope everything will go well now. <laughs> uh, it is a big honor for me to take part in this conference. Uh, and also, I am very thankful to Professor Darius Kuczynskas who introduced Czerlonis historical background and his main uh, results in the synthesis of arts. Uh, I try to see uh, to the phenomena of Cerlonis from different point of view, perhaps more through the creativity prism and also uh, my main focus will be on uh, to learn his creative impulses and creative results uh, which could be seen in, in the frame of uh, his harmonization of folk tunes. So, uh, let's start from more theoretical background and uh, ideas about creativity which is the main topic of this conference. I shall see the starting point of thinking about creativity is uh, from Joy E. Guilford when he wrote his famous article about creativity, about divergent and convergent thinking. And this is my starting point. If we be the honest, this problematics is not problematics of musicology or uh, composing. Uh, it's uh, psychological problematics, but somehow it is related to music, to composing, to what is going into the brain of a composer. And, uh, and you see that it's a very big mystery why one composer is famous, another is unsuccessful, and so on. There are dozens of reasons about this. And we are in the process now to think what is creativity, how it could, it could help composer, or how it could be somehow an obstacle for composer to live a very easy life. I see that there, uh, there are some four main abilities of when we are talking about um, about uh, creativity and these uh, four abilities joy guilford uh, it pointed out as a fluency originality flexibility and elaboration yes these uh, are right and uh, 
still we have a lot of works dedicated to the these main abilities and I'm of a follower of uh, Guilford was Torrance he elaborated test how we can measure this fluency originality flexibility and elaboration uh, mainly the three the, the the first fluency originality and flexibility and uh, and this test is a large and a very good instrument just if we want to see how this uh, creativity is expressing also there is a very interesting Dembo Rubinstein test of self evaluation also based on the main this uh, on the fluency originality flexibility and also uh, adding some uh, another aspects as you know creativity is uh, some mystery and there are now uh, more than 50 uh, elements which could be somehow related to, to this aspect and also here I could mention that uh, in Lithuanian research tradition creativity also started to be investigated and there are few uh, psychologists who devoted their work to the creativity issues and it's uh, Ona Butkenia, Daiva Krakowskaitė, Karkotskenia and now more and more new colleagues are joining this research problem uh, I took some methodological uh, foundation and uh, wanted to, how could I, I approach Chirlonis when he is not alive you see that Torrance test and, uh, and Rubinstein test they are uh, so designed it uh, when uh, you are living person so you can apply this just like a short uh, short program just uh, you are doing test and 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 these qualities are shown but what to do when uh, the author you want to investigate and his creativity you want to investigate when he is not alive so we can do this trying to approach his works and Chirlonis is uh, very um, favorable in this respect so I used uh, Scott Isaacson and Donald Treffinger creativity definition which is uh, finding a new important appropriate connections which are expressed as the ability to foresee many possibilities to invent and try out different ways of decision to propose new and unusual possibilities and to create and select alternative ideas these four points these four points could be also somehow mm, reduced just to, to looking and invent different ways and um, in this um, definition decision is um, the world the, the word word which indicates the more I would say more philosophical attitude or more philosophical approach to this to, to these problems as the creativity creativity problems are very large you see in every sp space in every place you could somehow uh, be in touch with creativity or or not so this this was my working definition and I, I tried to look at Cirlone's uh, compositions very particular part of his uh, compositions dedicated to the uh, harmonization of folk tunes 
it seems very simple uh, pieces, but uh, what is important that they show very large and different possibilities how composer could approach traditional tunes and uh, how these tunes could uh, influence its, uh, uh, I would say, its ability to see some new possibilities and uh, how this uh, application of these new possibilities could uh, enlarge your understanding of, uh, of music and uh, provide uh, to compose the new possibilities where and what he should do the next. Uh, let's start from uh, the, from the fol folk tunes, Lithuanian folk tunes. And uh, in the surrounding of Turlonis, we see um, very interesting and very, I would say, very rich folkloric materials. And Cirlonis was very sensitive to, to his uh, surroundings and, his, and uh, his soundscape was very interesting at, at his living time. At this time, in uh, Dzukiya, is uh, very rich in so folk songs and we could find uh, very special and very particular songs in, uh, uh, in this region. So I, I could uh, distinguish two, or just two separate styles in a folkloric material which could influence Cirlonis at, at his time. Uh, one sort is was monodic tunes in very short range, and usually uh, they were very common in uh, the uh, calendaric and labor, uh, labor times and also in, uh, in weddings. And uh, as an example, I would like to show you some musical uh, excerpt from a typical traditional tune. Uh, it is, um, it, is um, it was sung during the rye reaping and uh, these songs, uh, later on, we shall go more in details, how composer used these elements in his, in, in his own composition. kaip man galima būti pereiti prie šito ir paskui vėl atgal sugrįžti. O, ačiū labai. O, oh, jie, jis very short excerpt. Shall go further. Uh, Cirlone started to harmonize Lithuanian traditional songs when he was uh, choir master. And uh, 
this, the first choir was uh, uh, organized by him in a Warsaw outskirts from Lithuanians who were, uh, who were living in, a, in Poland, in, a, in Warsaw. And for, for this reason, he used and he harmonized some folkloric songs just to, according to the needs of this choir. Choir needs repertoire and he composed these things. And it started in uh, perhaps uh, relations or that connections with the folk song started a little bit early, you know, five years ago. At least we have some documentation. Uh, but uh, after 1904, uh, and uh, during uh, 1906 was very productive times and uh, a lot of uh, traditional tunes were harmonized just to comply with the needs of these choirs. Uh, here is a picture of Warsaw choir members where Cerlonis is in the middle, in the central part. But let's see uh, how he approached traditional music. And, uh, and this will show the genesis of composer's creativity or just uh, its uh, new and new ideas how he, how he, he could implement using uh, traditional tunes. And also what is interesting that uh, he was understanding emotional and structural uniqueness of Lithuanian traditional music and always urged that composer has to know this very well and use and uh, compose his um, works based on, uh, on this knowledge and respect to Lithuanian traditional music. He, he wrote a very famous article about, where he wrote about that uh, traditional tunes are like uh, precious stones and only composers in, uh, um, he thought, in 300 years after his death or uh, perhaps they will be able to create something valuable based on these precious stones. Also, what was interesting that the uh, influence of Lithuanian traditional music is well seen in a composer's style and we could see how this style is changing slightly or sometimes very fast. And also uh, we see also radical innovations of musical language. Also uh, when we see in, uh, in this harmonized folkloric materials. Let's start uh, concrete examples. Uh, sorry, due to time reasons, I will not provide you some musical uh, singing materials, but just uh, as you all are professionals, you could imagine how these structures are sounding well. Yes, it's a traditional, you see, tra traditional tune was uh, often kept unchanged. So Cerlonius was very respectful for, for traditional, to traditional materials and he uses original tune on the upper voice usually. And then the, the next voices will be attached, just added to this main voice. We see here very traditional from the first sight, but in essence it's something not traditional. Uh, you see, it's a modulation. The song started from the A major and ended in a C major. In traditional tunes, you never see mod modulations and, and some. So, the composer is looking, is using traditional things, but the result is new something. Let's go. It's an early material. Uh, I hope it's, it's uh, 
perhaps uh, belongs to the to the times when he was studying in uh, Plunge, and uh, he wanted to make uh, some gay to, to make some joy for the count of Nikola Soginski, and uh, and he did some melodical arrangements. So we see very simple arrangement, and we, that uh, is a burdonic, very stable structure in the left hand, and the melody line is very simple, also typical arrangement, two voices arrangement, I, I would say classical arrangement, yeah, but also a little bit innovative because he uses this burdonic feature and the burdonic feature also was mixed with the traditional harmonization of two voices. Usually in classical music it's very typical intervals. We see this. Uh, also here I provided some uh, vignette, some pictorial materials also related as these vignettes were uh, specially prepared when these um, songs has to be published. And we see also some attitude toward these songs. We see a lot of embellishment. Embellishment means some sentiments. It's not an expression of uh, a big sentimentality, but otherwise we see that composer was somehow impressed and he loves folk songs. Uh, here is also very typical harmonization. Nothing very new, but also we see some alterations. They are, uh, now we, we shall see how this um, renovation of the musical language, how it will go step by step, so adding alterations. Then we, th we see repeating, some repeating formulas. Uh, you see on the left hand, the right hand is the same, the same simple as we see, typical. But the, the left hand, we see some repeating figures it's like uh, like sets, some perhaps some rhythmical, not very clear. Uh, you see sometimes a little bit changing in uh, in some details, but always this same rhythmical pattern, and it's repeated from different tones. And uh, from you see from C, from S from C from us and and finish it very simple like they started also some uh, some uh, 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 I would say retrogradic some implementation but not very very strict let's go Further, we see here in this example uh, also combination of uh, diatonic tune on the first line and also chromatic tune on the left hand. Yeah, diatonic and chromatic in one voice. And these are two different systems, and they could survive here. Another thing. Now we see chromatisms in different places, not in one tune in uh, this bass line, but also in in few voices. We could see second voice and then some part on the third voice, some this uh, chromaticism is not kept very strictly, but anyhow, it's um, somehow en enriching 
So diatonic plus chromatics. Also, we can see here some rhythmical, also very simple bordonic accompaniment, but which has some very interesting um, national implications. This rhythmical pattern is tam ta ta tam ta ta tam ta ta tam ta. It's a rhythmical patterns very um, common to Polish dances. Some Polonese dance could be. Uh, and also, when we see his musical compositions at, at, at that time, at the beginning of uh, 1900, yeah? at this time, Chulonis was not uh, nationally, I would say, he was indifferent nationally, na na nationality. Uh, part of his was Polish, and he started also to think like Lithuanian. At this time, it was a nationality of Grand Kingdom of Lithuania, or just Common Republic of Polish-Lithuanian. So there was not strong differences. And these people, they, like Mickiewicz and uh, another, another artist, they were of both these nationalities, and they declare this very clearly. Say, Mickiewicz, I am Polish, I am Lithuanian of Polish or Pol Polish of Lithuanians kingdom and so on. And at this time, we see a very interesting combination, a Lithuanian tune on the, on the upper part and the Polish accompaniment on the right hand. Yeah. Uh, Later on, he also uh, went once more, also recreated the same song when he was, uh, when he decided that he is a Lithuanian artist. And he recreated this song in a different way. And in this time, this uh, composition song uh, was harmonized in such a way that we can also say, uh, oh, it's a Lithuanian, it's a pure Lithuanian now sounding, a different kind of uh, mentality. We see more serious, more complicated, more calm, without dancing elements, very clearly shown. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, to the very interesting part of uh, my observations. We can see some also harmonization. Uh, it's uh, when you, and you try imagine what tonality it is. You can see three tonalities. You say A, G, and C minor. Yeah, you see it's a polytonality, typical. So we can see some progress in this respect. Okay. Now we can see some uh, artificial modes also. The first line was the same as we listened. It's a ta da da ra ram yeah? But just, uh, you see, uh, on the left hand, we, we see octatonic scale. The same tune was harmonized in an uh, uh, artificial scale. Yeah. Another thing, uh, also here, we can see how composer used uh, this uh, thematical short materials like um, like replica, like uh, not like citatos, but very short um, replicas and uh, incorporated into the large composition. And this uh, ta da da ra ra, yeah, some like a, an element of this, the same. And here we can see some uh, his composition. Uh, we never find original tune, what was used, but it's a, a, some composition, composer used, uh, he composed, he created folkloric tune. And now I am going very fast to the, uh, I wanted to show how this uh, uh, song, when we saw the, uh, about this uh, Rai Ripping song was used by his 
in, in, in a composition of Beckett Borelli. Mm, uh, just I'm going very, very, uh, I would say, fast from, from these things. And the, the sister of Cirlone is Cirlonite, writes about her impressions. He remember how it was when the composer was listening to these tunes and how he used all these materials. And we can see that, uh, that uh, he was improvising. The brother improvised on the piano for a long time. And the same sad, wild field song still emerges from the fullness of the sounds. That begins, no one knows. Her name is Lithuania. And this, uh, uh, in these variations, we are also very interesting. And they show how could be approached traditional music and uh, how composer could uh, compose different emotional results from the same tune. And uh, on the end, this was pro procession, procession, how the, when this uh, rye reaping woman, they ended their hard work, they went in a procession and it was very typical for, for this ritual. We can see this uh, vignette of this, the same song and this composition. And now I want to very shortly his expression of composer's attitude toward traditional, traditional village and traditional songs. We see very respectful attitude. Now, uh, the second thing what I wanted to, to stress was uh, sharing ideas among different arts. And the uh, professor already talked about very interesting applications. And I see some, perhaps some adding things, some or very simplified things, just to show you the same, but from different materials, yeah. Here we see how Julianus started his painting and what style, symbolistic, very simple, very primitive, but also with interesting ideas, yeah. And here we see the end of these things. What I would say that we, what we see from this um, picture also, it's uh, styles of polyphonical development. You see answers to two thematical materials, also inversions. We can see also retrogrades and uh, retrograde inversions and so on and so on. All, all this, uh, polyphonical elements they were used in the paintings. Also, it's a cyclic sonata. Also, we can see that some moods, very interesting, and also repeating some elements. You can see on the second, yeah, that repeated some mills, yeah. And also, uh, several layers we can find, but especially it's very well seeing these separate layers is like in, po in polyphonical pieces. We can see separate voices and they are all very separate and very important. Also here we can see that uh, um, fantasy, how the fantasy works of Chirlonis. It has no limits, but also some, uh, also some theoretical restrictions we can see these lines and these uh, separations, yeah. It's, uh, see, how composer is dealing with this. So he is controlling this flow of his, his imagination. And here my last example about how he was predict, how he, how he predicted the future of Lithuania. And we see some, it's a prelude, a lot of uh, musical, names will be based uh, on the pictures. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I have some conclusions, but you can see they are a little bit known. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation and maybe some questions, comments.
Yes, so, so if we do not have any questions, we're slightly late. Oh, I see Milos. Milos is trying to talk to us. Okay, just a moment. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, this question could apply to, to actually to both previous lectures. Yeah. Um, this relation between uh, music and painting and music and literature, uh, what seems to be most difficult to uh, transpose from music to other arts? Is the picture organization or to be uh, more specific, um, the question of the key of, of tonality. Has there been any research into this? Uh, I mean, symmetry is very easy to understand. Um, um, to find equivalence to, let's say, inversion or retrograde or, or things like that, it is, it is plausible. But, uh, you know, one key as opposed to an R key, tonic as opposed to the dominant, uh, has anyone addressed this issue? Perhaps through color, since he was in synesthet, uh, perhaps something like that could be could be searched for. Yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting. And now, yes, there are a lot of works um, dedicated to the synesthesis, and uh, our knowledge now goes uh, far far away from, from, from this knowledge, which was and I am at the beginning of uh, 20th century, yeah. So there are interesting interconnections. And I would say that, um, yeah, everything is in, um, also, it's, it's unfinished yet. And we can see some uh, things in very interesting um, things and the relationships in a tonality and in a, in a color, as you mentioned, it's very inter interesting here. Yeah. This uh, uh, interpenet penetration and uh, the feeling of uh, color and feeling tonalities. And also, there are a lot of things to do in the future. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. John. Okay, thank you. Yes, so, okay, so we have to move thank on. You. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank, thank you, for you your very attention. much for all, all the presentation. And now, now, <clears throat> since we, we know that uh, Ada at all, which, which is scheduled to present now is already re already <laughs> ready to do this so we are not switching the order of, of our presentations as as it was planned a few hours before so now i invite uh, just before inviting uh, the presenter at, in this at this point i probably should mention that we have the concert of Cirlone's music tonight uh, in, in the Music Academy in the Great Hall, 6 p.m. And uh, you will be able to hear piano cycles of Cirlonis. So welcome to, to attend the concert and to complement those two, two presentations with music. Yes, and now we invite Are Tol from um, Estonian Academy of Music and Theater. And he will present his, his paper, um, uh, <clears throat> Neomythologism in the Music of Velio Tormis, Arvo Pert, and Bronius Kutavicius. So, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. And I'm, I'm also trying to switch on the share screen option so that I can uh, display the contents of my, 
on my presentation. So now, can you also see the the opening slide of the presentation? Yes, we see you and we hear you. So excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and greetings from Tallinn. Uh, so my topic is neon mythologies in the music of Velia Tormis, Arvo Pert, and Bronis Kutavicius. The aim of this presentation is to explore some of the possibilities for describing the various musical trends of the uh, 60s and 70s, drawing on the example of these composers. However, I would uh, also like to share some remarks on the 20s and 30s, the age when fascination with folk music had been one of the driving forces in the Estonian musical scene, and it was indeed promoted by the cultural policy of the Estonian Republic. After the Second World War, many Estonian composers continued to be preoccupied, to a greater or lesser degree, with ethnomusicological sources, a practice that conveyed multiple ideological implications within the Soviet cultural system. The 1970s saw an upsurge of musical ritualism that emerged simultaneously, if not in causal connection with the variety of uh, uh, minimalist trends in the United States of America and Western Europe. So now about uh, the term I'm using or I'm referring to, neo mythologies is a term for a trend in 20th century literature, visual arts and music characterized by a preoccupation with symmetry, repetition, binary oppositions and specific uh, visual symbols. Victoria Adamenko in her book neo mythologies in Music uh, Drawing on the theoretical concepts of Carl Jung, Claude Revis Strauss, and the Tartu Moscow Semiotic School, has demonstrated how several traits of mythologism and ritualism are manifest in the music of Alexander Skriabin, Arnold Schoenberg, Alfred Schnitke, and George Crumb, amongst others. In my presentation, I will argue that many of these concepts uh, explained by Adamenko can also be applied. Uh, in Estonian music uh, of, the, uh, of the second half of the 20th century. Traits of neo mythologies can be traced in Velja Dormis's output dominated by choral works based on of the Estonian Regilaul tradition. Visions of the pre-Christian past are eminent in several of Bronius Kutavicius' works in the 70s and 80s. If the inclusion of Arvo Pert in this context uh, seems somewhat surprising, it is only because the self-description of the composer with its emphasis on Orthodox Christianity tends to obscure the pantheist undertones of his music and its reception. Now, I would like to present to you some visual images uh, related to the reception of, uh, of Arvo Pert. So, these are two uh, CD covers uh, published by ECM Records. And uh, now, what do we see? There are some trees depicted here, and to be more precise, uh, a leafless tree and another one with some leaves on. So, now, furthermore, there are some more CD covers and some more images of trees. And again, a leafless, leafless tree on the cover of the very best of uh, Arvo Pert, and it is complemented by a sense of symmetry, as if the image of the tree was, uh, was reflected on water. So, symmetry as well, and leafless tree. Now on. This is a stop image from a dramatization of Arvo Pert's music that was directed by Robert Wilson and was performed in Tallinn in 2015. The performance of the uh, production was called Adam's Passion, and again we have the same motive, a branch of a tree. And another image. I can also play you a short clip uh, from, this, uh, from this production, and please pay attention to the cross sign formed uh, by the participants here and here, and on the catwalk, and now again a tree as if it was uh, growing uh, upside down from heaven.
And I think that uh, Robert Wilson, the director of this production, has really captured something very essential about uh, Arobert's music, or the way how we perceive it. Uh, the movement, uh, there is either movement or the, the participants are standing still, so there are no some uh, uh, options in between either movement or standing still or festina lente, uh, slow motion. So, uh, sorry. Um, so I don't want to play, play it again, but uh, now I will, I will come back to this uh, image. So, and uh, furthermore, the image of the tree is something that uh, Arvo Bert himself has referred to in his uh, sketchbooks, which provide very important information as for his. Uh, creative uh, uh, practices, creative uh, method. But furthermore, if we observe the, the, uh, the images here reproduced on the cover of uh, the Cambridge Companion to Arvo Perte, uh, then we also can describe many of them as mythology games. For example, the spiral signs, the circular uh, shapes and so on, and Arbos, of course. And uh, these are indeed mythologemes, or visual representations of the basic recurring themes of a myth, often in the form of simple geometrical shapes like circle, sphere, triangle, square, pyramid, cross, etc. And a uh, circle can be considered as a representation of cyclic motion or eternal recurrence, also in a Nietzschean sense, but also cycle of day and night, seasons, and so on. But now, one of the most uh, specific uh, mythologemes is Arbor Mundi, or the world tree, a concept uh, in uh, many, if most, uh, uh, mythologies. In Norse mythology, the term is Yggdrasil, Estonians call it uh, Ilmabu, and uh, and also, here is the Lithuanian term for it, uh, by the way, uh, which is eponymous with a work by Bronis Kutavicius. And on the left, you can see a 19th century depiction of Yggdrasil. So this is something that is at the very essence of universe. It is the axis of the world. Now, furthermore, this uh, uh, movement uh, from Bronius Kutavicius's The Last Pagan Rites uh, is uh, uh, entitled Worship of the Oak. So again, worship of a tree. And, uh, and the notation, I would like to draw your attention to the notation, uh, although it is a very famous, uh, uh, famous one, but uh, it is a mythology as well. It is circle and uh, uh, and also represents all the aspects uh, of, uh, of recurrence and uh, cyclicity. But there are also other devices that can be used uh, to convey the sense of uh, eternal recurrence of, uh, or something uh, that is uh, ceaseless. Uh, let's consider, for example, this uh, passage uh, from uh, Bela Dormis's Ingrid Evenings uh, from the series Forgotten Peoples. And uh, at the very end uh, of this, uh, uh, this cycle, the participants, the singers, are ordered to leave the stage. Uh, so the singing goes off stage uh, and the same part is repeated. Uh, so until all the participants, all the members of the choir have, uh, have left the stage. And thus an impression is created as if uh, the, the singing, the process was going on, despite that all the singers have left. So uh, singing is much uh, more than just something uh, taking place in time. It is internal and that could be the, the uh, the context for this uh, for this uh, passage so 
Of course, uh, ritualism in Estonian music is uh, represented most of all by this uh, work by Vela Tormis, Rauwa Neetmine, or Curse Upon Iron, a very specific work uh, uh, for, the, for the fact that uh, it includes uh, a very uh, unusual instrument, uh, the shaman drum. But uh, it's not the only thing that uh, deserves our attention here. I would like to draw your attention uh, to, uh, to these words. Actually, these are not words, they are some syllables which are meant to imitate uh, the sound of uh, the Jews' harf. And uh, this is also actually one of the uh, characteristics of uh, neo mythologism as described by Adamenko in her book. Uh, so babbling or pronunciation of uh, meaningless uh, words. And uh, I also uh, read the citation by Levi Strauss here. Uh, meaningless speech loses all contact with ordinary language since it consists either of sacred formula incomprehensible for the initiated or belonging to an archaic tongue that is no longer understood, or even of utterances devoid of any intrinsic meanings, such as are often used in magic. So babbling is the magical language, and we we can encounter it in several of of um, Vela Tormis's works. But uh, let's uh, let's also see uh, a footage. And this is a dramatized performance from uh, 1985 of uh, Curse Upon Iron. And um, the things that one could uh, draw attention to while listening to it is alliteration and parallelism. So the linguistic uh, characteristics and the text, uh, by the way, is an adaptation of verses from uh, Kalevala uh, although there are some contemporary additions to it. Uh, so babbling, onomatopoetic sounds. And uh, in the footage, you can also see a depiction, a theatricalization of uh, pagan rituals. And uh, the central role, of course, is played by the uh, ceremonial fire and uh, the shaman drum, which uh, as is no accidental, is uh, round-shaped. So now, again, the drum functions as a, as a mythological symbol. Now I'm trying to initiate the footage. It's about uh, uh, less than two minutes. Uh, So this was a theatrical uh, station of uh, of uh, a curse upon iron, and uh, 
maybe you wondered who the shaman was. Uh, if you looked carefully, maybe you recognized the conductor Tönu Galjuste. No, so there was no real shamanism involved in this performance, but uh, but uh, but a show. So, uh, but uh, it has uh, some uh, uh, further cultural meanings uh, uh, because in the 1970s and uh, 80s, against the backdrop of political stagnation and increasing Sovietization, references to shamanism were used as a means of constructing the Estonian national identity. So these uh, shamanist connections, references are something uh, really typical of that uh, period. And of course, Vela Thormis was the main exponent of, uh, of that uh, movement. Uh, and as part of that process, links with the Eastern uh, Lena Ugrian ethnic groups were emphasized because shamanism is something that is not, uh, has not been uh, part of uh, Estonian society for, for uh, God knows how many centuries, but uh, it, it can still be found uh, among some, some other Fennogrian ethnic groups living in, on the territory of the, Russian, uh, of the Russian Federation. So, but now another uh, example of uh, babbling. This is from Vela Tormis's uh, Four Etudes with uh, Johan Wiedink. And now If you look at this uh, this note uh, and the syllables, then you can see how the tone color is uh, modified by means of uh, of vocalizing uh, different uh, uh, vowels. So, and I've also included in here all the vowels in the Estonian language. So, uh, the only vowels that are not used here are ö and ä, but the all all the others are present here. But there's a further nuance. The the, uh, this word, uh, well, this is not just a vowel, but it has a meaning in Estonian, uh, in the Estonian language, it means night, so like night and day, it means night. Uh. And uh, also, this passage features uh, descending octatonic motion, so all this material is based on one transposition of the octatonic scale, uh, something that also became quite common in the works uh, of Velia Tormis, although there are some uh, instances of, uh, of using the octatonic scale also in the 1930s in Estonian music. Uh, now I would like to share some comments uh, on the driving forces behind the Estonian uh, neo-mythological -mytholo um, uh, movement uh, in the 1970s. Uh, first one of these was certainly uh, interest in, uh, in Estonian traditional music, in folk music. Uh, in 1970, an anthology of Estonian traditional music was, uh, was published uh, that contained uh, five uh, LP discs. Uh, and Velja uh, Tormis, uh, when he was uh, uh, teaching uh, in our Estonian Academy of Music and Theatre, uh, that must have been uh, at least uh, 10 years ago, uh, always spoke with great respect uh, of that uh, anthology. He described it as the ultimate uh, guide uh, to the authentic uh, uh, tradition of uh, singing regilaul and also the best guide uh, to his own music. Uh, so by listening to these old recordings, uh, one can get an idea of how Tormis' uh, folk-based, uh, folk music-based music should also be performed. And by the way, it is also available online. But there are some uh, other uh, forces as well behind that, uh, that uh, movement. Uh, in the stone and literary circles of the 60s and early 70s, there was an upsurge of fascination in Søren Kierkegaard, Karl Jung and Jerzy Krotowski. Innovative ideas concerning literature and dramaturgy were disseminated in the self-published Almanac Thespis, the authors of which included Paul Erik Rummo, Malti Unte, Aino Vahing, Anto Runnel, Arva Valton and Jan Kaplinski. Uh, in the neo-mythological themes of that period, uh, uh, they can be considered in the context of a Jungian quest for archetypes and the collective unconscious. 
uh, several researchers have actually mentioned uh, this connection, the connection with Jung, uh, Arvo Bert and Jung, for example, uh, in, in a book by uh, Leopold Brauneis. However, it is also important to, to note that, uh, that uh, Carl Jung actually was one of the figures that had uh, a great influence uh, on the Estonian cultural scene at that time. Uh, Arvo Bert's uh, connection with neo mythologies, as mentioned, is probably uh, the most uh, complicated one of the of the three composers mentioned. Uh, however, this is something that one can observe both in his uh, early avant-garde period and also after his uh, stylistic turn that took place in uh, in the mid 1970s. In Arvo Bert's music, as well as in its reception and uh, in, the, uh, in the information that uh, Arvo Bert has shared about his uh, own ideas, uh, one can witness many binary oppositions, modern versus antique, uh, light versus darkness, purity and vulgarity. Let's consider, for example, credo for piano, mixed choir and uh, orchestra which includes uh, the first uh, C uh, major prelude by, by Bach, the Svolte Imperatus Clavier, and then some, so to say, modern avant-garde techniques to represent uh, the other side, the vulgar side or the dark side of, uh, of that uh, topic. Also, collage is something very characteristic of both the avant-garde technique techniques, and it is also something that is connected to bricolage, as described by Claude Lévi-Strauss in *The Savage Mind*. It is do-it-yourself bricolage refers to the construction or creation of an artwork from any materials that are in hand. After his stylistic turn, uh, these oppositions these binary oppositions uh, continue to be at the very center of, uh, of Bert's uh, musical thinking. Uh, well, we all, we all have heard how much uh, have, have been spoken of uh, sound and silence uh, in Arvo Bert's music, how he has uh, emphasized the important importance of silence as the primordial state from which everything other emerges. Uh, and uh, this idea, of course, is very, very well represented by Tabula Rasa, which has two movements, Ludus and Silentium. But also, uh, this binary opposition is at the very center of, of his uh, uh, Tintinabuli style, and that is stepwise motion versus triadic motion. And also, another, another work uh, that could be considered within this uh, paradigm, fratres, which means uh, brothers, and uh, mythological twins who may be visually, who are visually similar, but may be uh, contradictory in their, uh, in their essence, uh, uh, are indeed very, very characteristic of many myth, myth around the world. So, neo mythologies can be considered as a viable alternative to the various terms used to describe the compositional practices in the period from the 60s to the 80s, such as minimalism, holy minimalism in the case of Bert, or magical minimalism in the case of Tormis, as well as the avant garde practices involving, for example, indeterminacy, because many of the avant garde techniques I, I would like to emphasize are very deeply rooted in that uh, new mythological thinking. But one must also keep in mind uh, that there is a difference between how mythological and epic topics were used in 19th century music uh, uh, in connection with literary or programmatic explication and uh, how these uh, uh, new mythological topics occur in uh, post-World uh, War II music. Uh, and the difference is that uh, in the second half of the 20th century, 
new mythologism involves most of all musical structure, uh, for example, form, and also compositional technique in a broader sense, for example, notation. I would like to conclude uh, with a citation uh, from the web page of Warner Classics. Uh, this is uh, uh, written about uh, an album of uh, Arvo Pert's uh, music, The Sound of Arvo Pert. Uh, and uh, so the quotation begins, Arvo Pert creates music of deceptive simplicity and listening to his work can be a transformative experience. Imagine taking your ears on a retreat and you are some way to understanding why his work is so popular. The Arvo Pert that many people are devoted to today, including R.E.M.'s Michael Stipe and Burke, creates music that cleanses a sonic detox. So these uh, shamanistic uh, details are, are so deeply rooted uh, in the reception of Arvo Pert's music that uh, it almost uh, seems to be uh, self-evident uh, that uh, Arvo Pelt's music cleanses. Uh, but of course, this is something that uh, we construct uh, for ourselves. Uh, that's what some people feel by listening to his music. And of course, one cannot argue with feelings. But uh, we must uh, still try to explicate uh, the reasons why those uh, feelings are aroused. Uh, what is the reason why many people feel that it cleanses? whatever it means. Is it for the ratios expressed in music that have been uh, uh, covered by many musicologists, uh, the numerological aspects of Pert's music, uh, or is it uh, Christian universalism, uh, or maybe it's because of the supple combination of pagan and uh, Christian symbols. So we may say that uh, uh, Maybe the gulf between magical and holy is not so great after all in the case of uh, Arvo Bert. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Are. Uh, perhaps some questions or comments? Uh, Hi, I probably can't see me because your the webcam is pointing the wrong way, but um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, these guys that created this neo-mythological, uh, neo-pagan, shamanistic music, I'm curious, has this genre of music ever been used in an actual, do you know of anybody who's actually using this music in a neo-pagan context? You know, in other words, oh, yeah. Bronius Kotavicius wrote a piece, uh, you know, uh, glorifying the oak tree. You know, there is a neo-pagan movement in the, in the Baltics and other countries. Yeah. Has, has this music ever been used, been performed next to an actual tree in order to unironically uh, pay respects to a tree? You know? Uh, yes, uh, I think it's uh, these movements you're referring to, those uh, uh, subcultures are indeed very uh, characteristic of, uh, of today's uh, culture also in Estonia. I remember when a new street or a new promenade was, uh, was built uh, in uh, Tallinn, seaside promenade, uh, which uh, uh, people in Tallinn uh, have uh, grown to like. Uh, there was a public uh, uh, rage initially because some trees were taken down. So uh, um, the worship, the worship of trees, is something that is uh, so, somewhere very deep uh, in our in our consciousness. However, uh, I don't know exactly if uh, if these uh, works have actually been uh, used uh, uh, by these uh, in this context because well. The, the, the thing is that uh, Curse Upon Iron is actually quite a challenging work. It is not easy to perform and, uh, and professional 
choirs usually don't uh, get involved in such uh, uh, such uh, rituals. Okay, yeah, it's, I just I'm thinking about the parallel to sacred Christian music, for example. You know, there's there's concert works that are glorias and kyries and whatever, and then there's actual music written for, you know, for the actual ritualistic context. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'd be very interested to know if anybody's making music for actual non-Christian ritual. Do you know of anything like that? Uh, I think there can be some instances uh, in Estonian music in the 1930s, but uh, uh, I doubt whether there are some very good examples about it by some major composers in, uh, in the more recent times. But in the in the 1930s, yes, it was quite common actually some these uh, pagan uh, uh, themes were were promoted uh, uh, greatly in that uh, in that uh, cultural context. So sacred fires, uh, sacred trees, uh, yes, they can be encountered in uh, in the 1930s. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Oh, yes, Milos. Uh, one second. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, yes, uh, I can hear you. Okay. okay. I can see. Uh, now, uh, we understand um, certain ideological presuppositions for uh, this uh, topic, and we understand some kind of intellectual framework provided by Claude Lévi-Strauss and Jung and everything. But are there any actual anthropological data about uh, uh, these shamanistic traditions, uh, some vestiges perhaps not very visible, but existing in, in uh, uh, let's say, in Estonian culture, which are then used and actually researched in order to write this music? Uh, well, I, I think there, there have been certainly, again, in the 1930s, some attempts to revive the supposed uh, Estonian uh, ancient uh, religion or or some uh, uh, some uh, forms of worship uh, but uh, well we must consider them as uh, constructions uh, so it is very unlikely that uh, these traditions uh, uh, have existed actually the way how they are are, are described by by the proponents of, of these movements uh, that's what I suspected. I mean, that's that happens. That happens all all over the world. This sort of thing. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, and and, and of course, thank you for for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I think it's time to move to another presentation. So. Uh, And our final presentation um, of, of today is by Judita Zhukiena and Gabrielus Simas Sapiega, uh, called Institutionalization of the School of Composition, the case of Konas Music School. Uh, Judita Zhukiena is uh, our current uh, Rector of, of this academy, and uh, Gabriel Lucima Sapiega is a doctoral student here. Uh, this will be a pre recorded uh, presentation so that you cannot ask questions directly, but you will see uh, the email addresses of both uh, presenters and you will be able to uh, contact them uh, if, if you have any urgent. Questions? Yes,
Good day to everyone here. My name is Gabriel Lucima Sepiega, and today I will present a short report prepared together with Judith Ozukiene, which is the result of joint work in the project State Music School, Lithuania Conservatory de facto, which started this year. At the beginning of the 20th century, sorry. Century, especially after World War I, conservatories uh, were opened one after another in the neighborhood. In 1990, a conservatory was established in Riga, headed by Professor Jacek Vitos. The so called Fall Conservatories are opened also in Belarus, Vitebsk, uh, Gomele, and Minsk. The Tallinn Music School was founded in the 1990s and the Tallinn Conservatory was renamed in 1923, but only nationalized in 1935. In Lithuania this process was also started, but the establishment of a higher music school took some time. The aim of this lecture is to present the case of the establishment of the Kaunas Conservatory and to determine the mm, preconditions uh, for the emergence of higher school of music. According to the search, the formation of a conservatory from the de facto to the jure required a lot of creativity acts and one of the indicators can be considered the emergence of a composition class. The story about Kona's music school can be told in a simplified way. In uh, 1990, Yuasa Snoyalis, a famous uh, Lithuanian organist, composer and graduate of the Warsaw Music Institute, founded a private music school in Kona's, which was nationalized in uh, 1920 successfully ex existed and uh, expanded uh, for more than a decade. In uh, 1933, under the direction of composer Juozas Gruadis, Kaunas Music School was closed and a new Kaunas Conservatory was opened in its place. Today we connect the Lithuania Academy of Music and Theatre with the history of this school. However, the story began a little earlier. Music education in Lithuania is associated with the activities of uh, Vilnius Cathedral and University, private music schools of manors and cities. We find the hope of establishing a conservatory in Mikolaus Konstantinas Shulonis letters. In 1907, December 16, in a letter to Bronislava Volman in Chulonis writes about his aspiration to work at the Jakubowski's music school in Vilnius. At the beginning of the 20th century, also Jozas Nojailis already had the experience of establishing and running a school in Kaunas, an organ course and an organ school were successfully established by him during the First World War. Permission was uh, granted to establish a music school in Kaunas, but only permission Noyalis noted. On the basis of the same submission to the German authorities, a request re reached the Council of Lithuania in June uh, 1918 we want to establish a conservatory in the capital Vilnius as it will be difficult to implement this idea in our financial circumstances. We apply to the Lithuania Council to recognize the conservatory as a Lithuanian state and to sub subsidize it responsibly signed by Juozas Nojalis, Teodoras Brazis and Juozas Talet Kelpsha. We find the e echoes 
of this presentation in the uh, Kelpsha letters to Olaka, the Council uh, acknowledge the estimate uh, as excessive and returning it, it. where was not priest Brazis and I couldn't do anything alone. However, this ambitious effort was widely known among musicians, as uh, mentioned by Nuyales, Gruades and other in, the, in their writings and the conservatory still had a long way to go and a lot had to be done about it. After the First World War, after the restoration of Lithuanian independence, but the loss of Vilnius and the relocation of the capital to Kaunas, music education moved Joses Nojales opened a music school in 1990 uh, with permission and uh, subsidy. As Joses Nojales wrote about the beginning in 1923, the work of the music school began in March 1919 in uh, an apartment pleasantly given by the priest uh, Olszauskas. There were several rooms on the third floor of the Saura Gymnasium, which housed several pianos. The first uh, teaching staff consisted of uh, Nojales, Starka and Oleka. There were about 40 students. In uh, 1920, when the school lost its newly designated and renovated premises, it was uh, treating it with closure. The principal of the school handed over the institution to the patronage of the Lithuania Society of Arts Creators, who instructed Joza Stelet Kelpsha to act uh, as a head and provided several rooms in the building at Myronis Street. Thanks to the effort of U.S. Uh, Stelet Kelpsha and also the entire society, uh, the school was nationalized in the autumn of uh, 1920 and continued to operate. From uh, the very beginning, the school has had famous artists, the best experts in the field, and educators who have trained uh, the new generation of Lithuanian musicians. In 13 years, uh, the number of teachers has grown from the three to 33. So let's pause uh, for the slideshow of teachers in the autumn of uh, 1930. It contains the names of the most famous musicians of the interwar period. Most of them had graduated uh, from higher education institutions abroad and the knowledge and experience adultly um, matched uh, the qualification of the higher education teachers. It is obvious uh, that the teaching tradition of several schools in Kaunas School of Music are intertwined. Most teachers graduate from the Leipzig and St. Petersburg conservatories, as well as the Warsaw Music Institute and the Moscow Conservatory. Although we also find graduates of Vienna, Budapest, Tallinn, Riga, Berlin, and other music school in the teaching staff. And other very important case is about students. These uh, were young people of different ages, different musical backgrounds, different activities in life. In a document submitted to the Ministry of Education in April uh, 1925, we find the following list. Attending university, 12. Attending schools, 78. 
other schools eight 98 students in uh, all other schools officials 43 officers and soldiers 10 other professions 11 total number of uh, serving peoples 64 for those attending a music school alone 57 since uh, the establishment of the institution the number of students has grown steadily we see from the 58 to 239 and this uh, slide shows the description of the students by speciality classes in uh, the 1933-1932 school years uh, the most popular was the piano specialization where uh, eight students in the composition class at uh, that time T uh, tuition was paid but scholarship uh, were awarded to the most talented in the list of scholarship holders we find uh, the names of the personalities who later become famous artists, choir conductor, uh, for example, Konradas Karadskas, composer Jonas Nabozhes, Viktor Skuprevičius, uh, and others. Juozas Naujalis uh, finished his uh, speech uh, in uh, 1923 saying, so, the school of music has talented and serious teachers it has talented students it lacks only one suitable housing in order for a music school to develop and expand normally it is essential to have a place that it's fully suited uh, to the affairs of a music school after receiving such uh, premises the school of music turns into the Lithuanian conservatory in the true sense of the word because in the field of music uh, science the conservatory program is still followed other uh, important aspect is teaching programs when uh, reviewing the archives files, uh, we find very clear evidence uh, that the experience of uh, other foreign uh, higher music school was used in the preparation of uh, programs and submissions to the ministry. We are uh, seeing letters from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs proving information, for example, on the condition of admission to French music schools. The preparatory documents are based on the examples of the conservatories of St. Uh, Petersburg, Leipzig and Riga. The school activities were based on the Music School Act, which appeared in the government's news exactly a uh, hundred years ago in November 1921. It is a seemingly straightforward document containing the most important provisions. It is important to note that it also provides uh, for the specialization of composition, which was included only in the programs of a higher school of music, whose from the very beginning uh, preconditions was formed for the school to expand and claim the status uh, of a conservatory. The word conservatory is used periodically and appears as a keyword in various scriptures and context. For example, in uh, 1923 the Lithuania Conservatory program was prepared even printed in a printing house and submitted to the ministry, but it was not approved. Uh, a letter from the director Juozas Nuljalis to the Ministry of Education in 1924, which uh, stated that in order for a music school to develop and expand normally, 
it is necessary to have an apartment that is fully suitable uh, for the music school. After receiving such apartment, the School of Music turns into the Lithuania Conservatory in the true sense of the word, because in the field of music science, the program of conservatories are still followed. In uh, 1925, the draft statue of the conservatory is submitted to the ministry, but again, the document does not receive approval. In uh, 1926, according to document, was quite tense. There are in internal difficulties and uh, external obstacles. In uh, March, Noyales signed a request to dismiss he him as director. In November, the ministry con uh, convinced a group uh, on uh, merging Kaunas and Klaipeda music schools. In uh, 1927, U.S. as Grodis took over the management of the school. At the same time, he took over the conservatory aspiration uh, formulated by Noyalis and uh, U.S. as Telekilpsha. It was U.S. as Grodis, a composer and conductor, uh, who became an important figure in the history of the conservatory. Until then, there was no professional composition teacher at Kona School of Music. Then he started teaching. Uh, December uh, also set up a composition class. This brought the music school even closer to the conservatory. In uh, 1930, Kona School of Music celebrated its uh, 10th anniversary, a special uh, commemorative publication is used, an important part uh, of which is uh, a review of uh, school activities prepared by the principal. In it again we find uh, a conclusion characteristic of school communication at that time. In the ten years of its life uh, the music school has actually grown into a conservatory. In 1932, the draft statue of the conservatory was again sent to the ministry, and, his and this time it was approved. In January 1933, the statue was legalized and published in the government uh, uh, magazine, and the composition was named uh, the first number among specialization. And already in June, the first graduates uh, of a conservatory will graduate in composition. Among them is Jonas Nabozhes, the first graduate of a con composition class, composer and musicologist, long-term uh, lecturer at the Lithuania Academy of Music and Theatre. Thus, following the patch of establishment of the Lithuania Conservatory, efforts were made to increase the variety of programs and subjects, to strengthen the qualification of the staff and to develop uh, the contingent of students. It took 15 years for the idea of conservatory to become a reality. This was uh, facilitated by the diplomatic skills and managers and the whole team and often, often by creative solutions, uh, visionary curriculum design. In fact, already around 1925, the Kona School of Music met the requirement for the European Music School of that time and the aspiration to train composers and later the curriculum opened up wider trajectories for identity and institutionalization for the institution. Kona School of Music recognized in Kona's conservatory now considered as the Lithuania Academy of Music and Theatre uh, uh, the tradition of musicians' education and promotion of creativity. 
the founder and director of the composition class he was as good as become the founder of the entire creative and pedagogical school of lithuania composers and the specialization of composition composition has become one of the indicators of becoming a high school of music uh, thank you for your attention Thank you, Simas, uh, and this was the last conf uh, presentation of uh, today. Uh, I would like to remind you that tonight at, uh, at 6 uh, p.m. we have a concert, uh, Unidentified Cycles of Chirlonis. Unfortunately, it won't be broadcasted, so I... Uh, so we will uh, meet with our online uh, participants tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, have a great evening and bye. <laughs>